This meeting of the Escambia County Board of Adjustments for what's today? For September 20, 2022. April 20, 2022 is hereby called to order. With seven members present, we have a quorum. Will the clerk please swear in members of staff? Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? I do. I do Members of the board, copies of staff's resumes have previously been provided and remain in on file for reference. The board has previously recognized staff as expert witnesses. Does anyone have any questions regarding their qualifications? and abilities to offer expert testimony. Seeing none. The BOA meeting package for April 20, 2022 has been presented with Development Services staff's findings of fact. The chair will now entertain a motion to accept the BOA meeting package into evidence. Do we have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion by Willie, second by Judy. Those in favor signify raise your right hand. Motion passes unanimous. Do we have proof of publication? Yes, sir. Did the publication meet all legal requirements? Yes, sir. Chair will now entertain a motion to waive the reading of the legal advertisement. Do we have a motion? So moved. Motion second. by Judy, second by Willie. Those in favor signify raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Members of the board, have you reviewed this uh, resume and transcript, transcript of the uh, meeting held on March 16, 
Upon review of the uh, resume and transcript, are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the resume of the Board of Adjustment held on that date. So Do we moved. have a motion? Second. Motion by Willie. Second by Willie. Second by Judy. Those That's in right. favor, signify to raise your right hand. Mr. Chairman. Sorry to interrupt, but that was a motion by Judy and second by Willie. Oh, I'm yes, sorry. Sir. We correct that. Thank you. Okay. The Board of Adjustments, the BOA, hears administrative appeals, variances, and conditional use requests. These hearings are quasi-judicial in nature. Quasi-judicial hearings are like evidentiary hearings in a court in a court of law, however less formal. All public testimony will be taken under oath, and anyone testifying before the BOA may be subject to cross-examination. All documents and exhibits that the BOA considers are entered into evidence and made part of the record. The giving of opinion testimony will be limited to experts, and closing arguments will be limited to the evidence in the record. After hearing the testimony and arguments for and against the proposed action, and before making its decision, the BOA will consider the relevant testimony, the exhibits entered into evidence, and the applicable law. Because decisions of the BOA relating to variances, conditional uses, and extensions of development order for site plan approval are final unless overturned by a court of competent jurisdiction, the county may issue development orders and permits for the properties in accordance with the decisions of the BOA. However, if applicant requests the issuance of any such order or permit, and such order or permit is issued, the applicant and not the county shall bear any risk that such decision may be set aside, the development order or permit may be revoked, or the development may be otherwise enjoined by the reviewing court. Any applicant for relief from a decision of the BOA for said actions or any aggrieved party as defined by state law may seek review of such decision by filing an appropriate pleading in a court of competent jurisdiction within 30 days of the BOA decision. The date of the BOA decision shall be the date the BOA voted at the conclusion of the hearing. Whenever the BOA denies an application, no new application for an identical action on the same parcel shall be accepted for consideration within a period of 180 days of the BOA decision. Any person aggrieved by a decision of the BOA relating to an appeal of an administrative decision may within 15 days thereafter apply to the circuit court for review. Each individual who wishes to address the board regarding a particular issue must complete a blue request to speak form and submit it to the clerk of board. These forms are located on the table at the back of the commission chambers. You will not be allowed to speak until we have received one of these completed request to speak forms. We must have these completed forms for public record. All written or oral communication outside of this hearing with members of the Board of Adjustment regarding matters under review today are considered ex parte communications. Ex parte communications are presumed prejudicial under Florida law and must be disclosed as provided in Board of County Commission Resolution 96-13 before a decision by this board can be made. The chair will ask as each case is heard that any board member who has been involved in any ex parte communication regarding the respective issue to please identify themselves and describe the communication. Our first case is Conditional Use 2022-05, U.S. Highway 29, Santa Rosa 196. Board members, has there been any ex parte communication regarding this case? I have relatives that live off of um, Highway 196, so I'm down that way all the time. Councilors. See any conflict with that at all? Thank you. Does anyone have any knowledge or information obtained from a site visit or other sources? Seeing none, does any board member intend to refrain from voting due to a voting conflict of interest? Seeing none, were the, uh, would the individuals who are party to this item please come to the podium and identify yourself 
State your name and address for the record and be sworn in by the clerk. Good morning, my name is Alara Mills Gutcher. I am the agent for the applicant. I am a certified land use planner and I can be sworn in. If you both wanna uh, raise your hand. Yeah, uh, Luke Strickland, I'm an employee of the developer. Uh, do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, help you God? I do. Thank you. And were you provided with a copy of the applicant request? I was able to retrieve the link to your website, yes. You uh, understand that all the findings of fact are available? Yes. Would you like to make a presentation at yes. this time? Yes, thank you. Yes, um, again, my name is Alara Mills Getcher. I am the agent, the agent for the applicant, uh, which is Terramore Development. We've been before you before. Uh, this is another site located off of Highway 29 near State Road 196 to develop a store larger than 6,000 square feet as a conditional use to be approved by you. Um, the site is at the intersection of a collector and arterial roadway. We meet the requirements, the other requirements required of the zoning district. Uh, this is in the RMU zoning district. So, uh, it's pretty simple. It's uh, just as we've always been before you before, it's simply to expand the size of the allowable use, which is restricted by the zoning district to a greater than 6,000 square feet footprint. Thank you very much. We will uh, pro uh, discuss it further with you in a moment. We'll have the staff's presentation at this time. Certainly, and then Luke is here to answer any Questions that are specific to the development, if you sure have thing. those questions. Thank also. you. John Fisher, Senior Planning, Escambia County. All right, so here we are showing the location map of Highway 29 and Highway 196. Um, this is showing the zoning map. Um, you can see it's zoned RMU, which allows for um, retail. This is the future land use of RC, which is rural uh, community. This is showing the aerial map of the location. This is the public hearing sign of a highway 196. This is looking onto the subject property from highway 196. This is looking north along highway 29 with another public hearing sign. This is looking south along Highway 29. Looking onto the subject property from Highway 29. Would the board like to go through stats findings or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. All right. Um, again, this is conditional use 2022-05. This is the request conditionally used to allow for construction of a retail store greater than 6,000 square feet, yet no greater than 15,000 square feet in the RMU zoning district. The proposed retail building will be approximately 10,640 square feet. Under criteria E, general compatibility, the findings and facts are based on the documentation provided by the applicant. The proposed retail store could be conducted and operated in a manner that is compatible with the adjacent properties and other properties in the immediate area. The primary intent of the RMU district is to sustain rural communities by allowing greater residential density, smaller residential lots, and more diverse mix of non-residential uses than the agricultural or rural residential districts. The RMU district allows public facilities and services necessary for health and safety and welfare of the rural mixed-use community and other non-residential uses that are compact, traditionally neighborhood supportive and compatible with rural community character, further meeting the purpose of the RMU district. The site meets the location criteria according to section 3-2.4. The property is at the intersection of Principal Arterial US Highway 29 and Collector Road Highway 196 Burma Park Road. The location criteria are established with the RMU zoning district to promote compatible ability among uses, especially new 
non-residential uses in relation to existing residential uses such as the proposed use. Under criteria B, facilities and services, uh, the findings and facts um, show that water, septic, trash, et cetera, will need to be addressed by the applicant during the site plan review process. The property is located within the Molino Utilities um, water jurisdiction. The project is proposed to be on a septic tank and would need to be evaluated by the Exchemia County Health Department. All public facilities and scheme and services for the proposed use and the capacity requirements must be met during the site plan review process. And the criteria C on site circulation. Based on this middle site plan, ingress and egress will be from Highway 196. As the road is under Exchemia County jurisdiction, the developer will need to coordinate access to the parcel with Exchemia County access management during the site plan review process. Preliminary vehicle and pedestrian safety, on-site circulation, traffic flow, and emergency vehicle access appear to be adequate for the proposed use. Evaluation is needed by the county transportation personnel to ensure maneuver Maneuvering of delivery trucks is satisfactory, as well as on-site circulation requirements of the land development code are met. This evaluation will occur during the site plan review process. Further evaluation of the parking will be conducted during the site review process as well. Nuisance and hazards. Um, based on the fact um, submitted plans, there were no nuisance or hazards associated with the proposed use. In general, the proposed use of retail sales typically does not generate any nuisances and hazards it would harm adjoining properties. Provisions of the Land Development Code do not allow the making of any noises or sounds which exceeds the limits of set forth of the LDC or the County Noise Ordinance. In addition, air pollutants, glare, vibrations, and other nuisance hazards, etc., are addressed by the LDC and must be met. The solid waste, criteria E, based on the application documentation, solid waste containers will be available and located in the rear of the building. The area will be screened and designed as to be viewed from the street. This requirement will be confirmed at the site learning process. Under criteria F, screening and buffering, the submitted site plan shows a 16-foot landscape buffer on the property lines abutting the adjacent properties as required by the LDC Design Standard Manual. Neighborhood commercial uses that are consistent with RMU zoning districts are required to provide a Type A 12-foot supplemented buffer with opaque fence or wall. Criteria G, signs and lighting. The applicant states that the proposed lighting will support safety for vehicles and pedestrians and will be installed downward as not to reflect on adjacent properties. This would meet the intent of the LDC concerning exterior lighting. Um, under criteria H, site characters, um, the size and shape, location, and topographic of the site appears adequate and accommodate for proposed use. Site requirements such as setbacks, heights, landscape areas are met and all the characters will be confirmed during the site planning process. Under criteria I, use requirements, there are no additional um, use requirements. Um, under staff findings, the applicant has submitted documentation that, that addresses all conditional use criteria. Staff recommends approval of the conditional use as requested pending approval and receipt of a development order through the site plan review process. That includes staff findings. Thank you. Board members, any questions of staff at this time? I don't have any uh, questions of the staff, but I have some of, I guess, Mr. Strickland. Can you go to the um, report? It has a conceptual site plan. like one of the very last on the report yeah which which way is the building facing which what is the which what road is is it fronting uh, uh, there are no park road okay and you have a retaining wall in the back then what is the use of the retaining wall? Uh, that is drainage related. Um, it's just, you know, that's something that is required due to the topography. Um, 
it's it's much lower than it than it appears um and uh yeah that's just a uh a measure due to the topography if, if we had more land there you know that would not be necessary but due to the site constraints that's a kind of a civil engineering requirement okay and your ingress and egress is um it is off of uh, 196 correct oh uh, yes there no park road okay so. and at, i know y'all haven't gone through the drc process but at this point you don't foresee any need for a turn lane on 29 or anything like that or do um, you foresee anything no i don't believe so um you can you can see oh. a, a turn yeah, lane that's a, okay. there um so i don't you know i think it's pretty well primed for that um but we would not expect seeing as the drive access point is from barano park road um we, we would not foresee any you know fdot uh requirements on that end seeing as there is a turn lane and um I show that uh, on this, it says that there's there's one sign kind of um, by 20 on the corner of 29 and um, 1i6. Is that correct? Yes, that pylon sign. Okay. Okay. That's correct. They're on the uh, southwest corner. Right. Okay. I have no further questions. Mr. Chairman, I've got a yes, question sir. or two. Uh, the pylon sign, first, the pylon sign is the only sign that you're requesting, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, and in the past, I don't know if you're aware, but in the past, when we've had uh, these uh, establishments in rural areas like this, uh, we have uh, required, as part of the conditional use, that they be not your traditional uh, looking uh, store, that they have the wood plank. Right, right, hardy board plank. Yeah, and uh, given that this is in a predominantly, well, a rural area, do you intend to do that on this store? Yes. Yeah, so site, uh, building specific, I am not sure, um, but that would be our intention. Would be to to match the the area. And typically, when you see the the you know just regular metal building, no facade upgrades, um, we we aren't typically doing those in Escambia County. Um, you know, most of ours definitely have a uh, have much more upgraded facade, and typically it is hardy board um, or some combination of Wayne Scott brick and hardy board. Um, so that would be our intention. I don't believe we have a locked in um, prototype as far as the facade, but uh, that would definitely be our intention. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I guess that answered my. Oh, uh, one other. The size. If I understand, is going to be over ten thousand square feet. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is, ten six forty. Is that more uh, about what the other stores have been in the uh, rural areas? I think we've approved. I believe two ninety one hundred um, from years past, around a year and a half ago. The the typical prototype uh, was bumped to ten thousand six hundred and forty, uh, with the intention to integrate potentially fresh produce and different. Um, you know, just an expansion of product. Um, but uh, I think of, in years past, they've been 9,100 square feet. Years prior to that, they were 8,500 square feet. Um, but now 10,640. So this would not be the first 10,640 built in Escambia County in, in the recent past, but it would be um, one of the earlier ones, I would say. Okay. And, uh, and you didn't seek any kind of access off of 29. Is that because of the the DOT wouldn't approve such a? I don't necessarily know that they would not approve, um, but it's just a, a much safer, easier, less complex entryway 
um, when you're able to go off a, a smaller thoroughfare than a, you know, that Highway 29 there has, has substantial traffic. Um, and anyone who's passed that is probably pretty, pretty well aware of that. Um, so any, any, you know, access onto to 29 is going to definitely uh, add a level of complexity and um, would definitely, uh, you know, be avoided if possible, which, uh, you know, Fair Oak Park Road provides that opportunity. And there's no red light there, right? Right, uh, that is correct. Okay. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that was mine. Thank questions? you. Questions? Any uh, other board members uh, have any questions of the applicant before we call on speakers? Any questions of the, from the board for staff before we call on speakers? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Speakers, we have to limit the time to three minutes per speaker. If for any chance you're just repeating what a previous speaker has said, it's quite all right to just say, I'm for the project or I'm against the conditional use. Did everybody hear that okay? We're limited to three minutes per, uh, per speaker. Thank you. Victor Alexander, please come forward, state your name and address, and be sworn in. Hi, my name is Vincent Alexander. I live at 1650 Highway 196, Molino, Wisconsin, or Molino, Florida, excuse me, 32577. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? Yes, I do. Thank you. I, I live next door to where the proposed Dollar General is going. I've already lived it in three years. I've already witnessed several accidents on 196 and 29 from uncontrolled intersections. It's fine as during the daylight hours at night. It's going to become a safety hazard. The driveway, when people miss it, they'll be turning around at my property just to get back to 196 to go to the Dollar General. An access should be, if anything, off of 29, not 196. I feel, I feel I've feel i seen these Dollar Generals, I see their racks of cardboard and stuff behind the stores, not making it to the dumpsters. The extra traffic flow is going to be burdensome on an on on already stressed intersection. I feel it's going to decrease my property value with the location, along with the other people's property value around as well with another Dollar General. I have a Dollar General on Molino Road. There's one at Neal Road. I don't know the name of the road next to the Arby's by Wind dixie There's also a brand new one that just went up on Highway 29 on the south side. There's one on 97 in Muskogee Road and one on 297 in Kingsville Road. I also feel the market is already saturated with Dollar Generals and we don't need another one in our area. They're just saturating us with Dollar General. I don't understand why they want to do this. And if the store goes vacant or they can't fulfill their profit obligation, what are they going to do in the future? You're going to have an empty store sitting there. We've already got several older buildings sitting along 29 up by Muskogee Road that are vacant or appear to be vacant and run down. I don't see the need of adding an additional building that's going to be 10,000 square feet or larger to that problem. Any questions for me? Yes, where is your home located? I don't know that we have a, do we have a better map that we might be able to? I'm the house to the right. And how far would you estimate that is from your, your home? About 200 feet at the furthest. Okay. The driveway is going to be right on the property line, which is going to be about 75 to 80 feet. All right, sir. And uh, are you the only home that's in the along the highway? Uh, Godfrey Squire across the street is a private driveway. There's a dirt road right there. Yeah. That's a private driveway that goes back. And there is also a property on the other side as well that another homeowner has behind the property. I don't know if you can see it in that picture. No, you can't. Well, where the immediate property is there, and then there's another homeowner uh, at the corner of Shag Road. To um, the east or east? To the east. It's not on the map. It's cut off. Okay. 
and it appears that the lot between you and the proposed store site is what just heavily wooded it's heavily wooded right now yes okay. all right sir thank you thank you any board members any other questions of the speaker seeing none thank you sir for thank your you. participation randy wood Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. State your name and address, please. Uh, Randy Wood, 1451 Rolling Oaks Drive, Molino, Florida, 32577. Uh, I'm totally against this, uh, Dollar General. First of all, literally from that point, and I'm not that far from that, that store, I could literally walk to the next one in about 15 minutes. It's, kind of, it's crazy. I mean, it, there's no need for this. It's a rural community. Uh, I do the same sentiment as the other gentleman said, that frankly, they're ugly. You're going to get riffraff. You're going to get trash everywhere. It's a bad location. 196, the road is tearing up already. We just repaved 29, and that section, they didn't go back far enough on, on 196. The road's cracking up now. There's potholes there. It's, it's just a bad location. There's no light, as you said earlier. There, is there a stoplight? No. There's a stop sign. There's a lot of accidents that happen there. This is only going to intensify the accidents. They've already put up a light down at Molino Road. I mean, and they had the same problem. Then they put one at the Atmore Cutoff. Same problem, wrecks. We're going to have more incidents and more wrecks in that area simply because of the store. Do we need it? No. We don't need it. There's no need for it. Like I said, you could walk to the next one in 15 minutes. It's that close. They've saturated the market. It's just a play on their stock to increase their stock price to build so many stores within a physical year. It makes no sense. I'm totally against it. Any questions? Board members, any questions of the speaker? Staff, any questions of the speaker? Applicant, any questions of the speaker? Thank you, sir. Kate Tremaine. Hello. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God? Yes, I do. Thank you. State your name and address, please. 851, uh, Kate Tremaine, 851, Molino Meadows Court. Well, basically, I agree with both gentlemen. Um, it, there's exits there all the time already. The 196 is falling apart because we already have too much traffic on it. There's, the, it's the, there's chunks missing everywhere, and that particular site, there's no way people are going to be able to slow down in time. It's just, I, I, I just object, <laughs> so I'm against it. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Board members, any questions? Staff, any questions? Mm -hmm. Applicant, any questions? Judith Vaughn. You don't want to speak? Okay. Nina Radford. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? Yes. Thank you. State your name and address. Nina Radford, 841 Molino Meadows Court. I, like others, are against this um, facility. We do have two and in very close distances, and there are numerous accidents. Uh, I've even witnessed them at 196 and Highway 29. 
So I think that adding another building there would cause even more problems. Board members, any questions of the speaker? Staff, any questions of the speaker? Applicant, any questions of the speaker? Thank you, ma'am. Paul Alexander. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of you, God? I do. Thank you. State your name and address, please. Paul Alexander. Live at 5050 Shag Road, which is around the corner from that. The property of my son that spoke in the beginning of this. We own the five and a third acres next to him, which we donated to him when he bought the house. We refused to build a house there because of that heavy traffic there. We bought the house on Shag Road. Since we've lived on Shag Road, there's been five deaths at that location, 529 and 196. You put a traffic light there, you think it's going to help. It didn't help at 97. Then it helped at Molino Road. It is not going to help there. You put a building right there, you're going to have a very big increase in wrecks. Very bad. Like previous statements, 196 is in terrible shape. But just repave Shag Road. That ain't going to help either because they're already doing 60 miles an hour down that road. Don't believe me? Put a sign up there and let the state troopers patrol it. We're going to have a bad wreck on Shag Road since they've repaved, repaved it. Last time I was here, I had an oxygen tank on a year ago. I do not believe we need this for the safety of this county. Do not allow this to go in. I object to this totally. Any questions? Board members, any questions? Of the I was going to add, I was going to add, when we bought the property, I asked for a fire hydrant to be put in. They said they can't put one in because that's a four inch main. A fire truck puts a five inch hose to it. They're going to suck that drain dry. So technically there's not enough water line there for a fire hydrant. Okay. So that's a very big concern y'all need to think about. If you put a store there without a fire hydrant, they got to pump it and they got to bring the water in on a pumper. Staff, any questions of the speaker? Applicant, any questions of the speaker? Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Uh -huh. Mr. Trayman, I hope I didn't butcher that up, sir. No, do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God? I do. Thank you. State your name and address. Raleigh Tremaine, 851 Molino Meadows Court. I'm in total agreement with the previous speakers. Totally against this. We witnessed a, a, a death when he died a few days later after he got T-boned at 29 and 196. It happens all the time. And it's, if you're going to make a left-hand turn coming north on 29, or right hand turn on the 196 and then have to make an immediate left into that parking lot. What about the cars that are trying to come up and down residences that live there that don't need this store anyhow? Think about us that live in the area or anybody else. There's another, I'm repeating what, uh, what everybody else has said. There's another Dollar General quarter mile up the road, another one a couple miles south. It's pointless. That's all I've got, really. Just uh, in agreement with the previous. Any Board questions? members, any questions of the speaker? Staff, any questions of the speaker? Applicant, any questions of the speaker? Thank, Thank you, you, sir. I'm showing that that's all the forms that I have. Did anyone fill a form out that we haven't called on you to speak? Is there anyone desiring to speak that didn't fill out a form? If not, we'll move forward. Uh, staff, would uh, you like to summarize, please? Just the last, uh, your final approval. Um, 
The overall condition of the staff's findings was the applicant submitted documentations um, that addresses all the conditional use criteria. Um, staff recommends approval of the conditional use upon the criteria, um, pending the approval of the development order and site plan review as going through the site plan review process to receive a development order. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for yes, staff. Sir. What about this? Uh, there have been several statements concerning the intersection where 196 meets uh, Highway 29. Has the staff considered any kind of safety issues connected with that uh, and with the proposed layout? So again, this has not gone through the development review site plan process yet. Um, so the, they're kind of just, they're kind of taking two steps. They know they had to get this conditional use first before they could even get a development order. So the applicant has decided to go through this process first without a pre really a pre-application to um, adhere to regular um, comments from the DRC staff. There, some changes may be made, some changes might not be made. We don't know until each reviewer has time to look at it. Um, this being a state road, um, Highway 29, the county doesn't have any say of what can, if a driveway can be put there or not, if a traffic light would be required to be put there. Um, that is something that our transportation department access management will look at from a county road standpoint and get with DOT to see what they want to provide. Um, there are minimum requirements of how far a driveway has to be set back from another intersection. And I believe that's why they put the driveway as far east as possible um, to give them more leeway time. And when people turn in off of Highway 29, they're not holding up anywhere um, on Highway 29. They will have to go east as far as possible on 196 before they turn into Dollar General. So their site plan looks pretty adequate for what we would look at through the development review process. Um, there are uh, just a couple facts that um, I was going through. The property to the east is 290 feet, the gentleman that has the house on there. The property to the north, the next house, um, is 800 feet to the north. And the other Dollar General to the north is, that is on Molina Road on the opposite side southbound, is two and a half miles to the north. Those were some questions that came up. What are and, the numbers? Oh, and the fire hydrant. Um, that will be part of the life safety fire hydrant will be part of the DRC process. Life and fire safety actually requests that they give that data flow of how much water is coming out there. And it's up to the developer to put a new fire hydrant or line in if it's not adequate. And what we're doing today, as far as the use goes, they're allowed to put that store there. If it's it. under 6,000 square feet. Right. So the, the use is allowed as zoned it's just the fact that they're increasing the size of the building correct okay. applicant would you like to make a uh, synopsis of your your uh, proposal summary yes thank you um I, I was listening to all the comments of the citizens that came forward and i just wanted to um kind of help understand that the traffic and safety concerns are something that the transportation or the traffic department needs to look at if there are certainly cra crash data that supports those 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 uh comments um as we had mentioned we're only approving the size of the store today we're not approving the store itself. That still has to go through the DRC, but this is the first step in order to submit that larger size building uh, so that it can be reviewed. Um, yes, there is amount, a fair amount of traffic on 29, but it is not a constrained roadway. There is adequate capacity for this type, type of development. Um, there's not a low level of service issue. There, there's, um, it's, it's just not that that built out and crowded right now. So there is plenty of trips available for this store. Um, and, you know, whether or not the condition of 196 is adequate, that's a paving issue. And again, that's a county road. So it's the responsibility of the county to make sure that if there's potholes, they, they need to be repaired. 
So as Miss um, Bass mentioned, we're just approving the size of the store today. Board, any questions? Thank you, ma'am. The chair will now entertain a motion regarding this item. In your motion, please state whether or not you adopt staff's findings of fact. And if, if for any reason you do not accept staff's findings of fact, please go through all the criteria and address each one specifically as to why you do not concur with staff's findings. Do we have a motion? I make a motion that we adopt staff's findings of facts and approve the conditional use. Do we have a second? A second. Mr. Chairman, for discussion. Discussion. We have a motion and a, and a second. Motion by Judy, second by Jennifer. Discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I might. Uh, be able to support this if included in our approval was the requirement that this store be the uh, wooded uh, exterior that we've had in the other ones that are in rural areas. Uh, if we, as I understand the Land Development Code, it's one of the elements and the goals of the code is to require uh, in agricultural areas that the rural character be preserved as much as possible. And uh, therefore, I, we have done this in the past and I would ask that that be included uh, uh, in our approval should it be approved. If I might call on Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, would that create any problem? Luke. Oh, it's strictly what I was going on. Um, no, like I said, like we would already plan to have some upgrades on the store. Um, you know, so if y'all were to hold us to the standard of having wood, um, you know, a wood veneer facade. I think that's plenty proper and would probably likely match our, you know, our uh, our intention already. So that wouldn't be overly cumbersome, and that's definitely something that we could uh, we could commit to. Would the makers of the motion be uh, objectionable to having that added as as a, I suppose as an amendment to the approval? I am definitely for that. So um, I'm going to amend my motion to um, accept staff's findings of facts with the um, understanding that uh, they will upgrade the building to include the hardy plank. Jennifer, do you have a problem with the second on that? I do not. I second. Okay. Any other discussion? Those in fa favor signify by raising your right hand. Those opposed? Six yea, one nay. Thank you. Motion passes, approved. Our next case is conditional use 2022-04-5595, Highway 95A. Board members, has there been any ex parte communication regarding this case? Seeing none, does anyone have knowledge or information obtained from a site visit or other sources? Seeing none. Does any board member intend to refrain from voting due to a voting conflict of interest? So, Mr. Chairman, none. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. I, would, I would like to refrain from voting um, due to a conflict of interest. Um, I own a local dump trucking company here in town and uh, my company subs for some of the contractors that run out of that pit uh, from time to time. And um, so I would like to refrain from voting. 
let the minutes reflect that Willie has recused himself from the vote on this conditional use item. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to note just in passing that while uh, I don't and uh, none of the other, though apparently the board members have any information concerning this particular case, for those who are, of us who are on the board, I guess a year or so ago when this matter came before us, we did learn information at that point. So we do have some information in the past has been. If we could remember it. It, it, it. That is, if we could remember it and get my age, that's a struggle. But at uh, any rate, I just. Technically. Technically, I just wanted to point the, that out. The, the, it's du du duly noted in the minutes. Mr. Chairman, also, I, if I'm not mistaken, and just a suggestion, I think we have a, some attorneys present for this one. It might be well, once we get into it, that every all the attorneys just make their appearance at one time so that they can get on the record. I'd suggest that for your consideration. I think that's a very good point. So let's begin with that before we call the representative or, uh, of the applicant. Let's introduce any attorneys who are going to uh, make a statement and who you, which side you're on. I'm Philip Bates. I represent Connor Realty, the owner of one of the adjoining or adjacent parcels of property. I also was here last year. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is William Dunaway, 125 East Intendencia, Pensacola. I represent the applicant. I was not present at the last um, hearing on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That being said, let's uh, have the applicant's uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said, um, my name is Will Dunaway. I represent the applicant in this case. Um, as the board has indicated, this is a um, quasi-judicial hearing uh, for approval of a conditional use and a conditional use for the um, establishment of a borrow pit mineral extraction in an agricultural zoning district. Uh, this is not for development review. It's not for a development order, and it's not for a permit to conduct any activity on it. It's simply the conditional use request for this land use category. This land use is a permitted use in your land development code under the agricultural. We are before you because in, under that uh, permitted use requirement, which is found at land development code 3-2, Point two B six, the permitted use for a borrow pit reclamation activities for a 20 acre site as a minimum uh, does require additional um, review and that additional review is found in your code at uh, section 4-7.6. It provides for the requirement for a conditional use before this board to ensure that certain conditions have been met with regards to, uh, the, to the use. And I'll read from your code the definition of the conditional use. A conditional use uh, is a use that because of special requirements, and in this case the special requirements dictated by your code at 4-7.6, uh, or characteristics may be allowed in a particular zoning district, here the agricultural zoning district, on a specific site after the Board of Adjustment confirms, confirms compliance with all conditions described by the Land Development Code is necessary to ensure compatibility with surrounding existing or permitted uses. So the, uh, the issue here is to review uh, staff's report, review their findings, review the evidence that is uh, submitted to you and to determine 
which is your final determination, which comes from uh, your code at Land Development Code 2-6.4C4, the action of the board. When, re when the reviewing board here, the Board of Adjustments, finds from the record of the hearing, again, the hearing that we're in today, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Godman mentioning that this applicant was before you uh, greater than 180 days ago on a, a different site plan for a similar use, but that use you denied based on that site plan, this, the 180 day period has, uh, has elapsed. He's now before you today with a different site plan. And in fact, as you'll hear from staff, uh, a different staff report, which recommends approval and shows that he's met these criteria. So once you have uh, determined that competent substantial evidence has proved the required conditions, which your staff report does, the board shall grant the conditional use unless the board finds from the evidence presented that granting the conditional use will be adverse to the public's interest. That is the standard from your code, and that is what we are here um, today to, uh, to discuss uh, with you and for you to make your decision. I know that staff now is next going to present uh, their uh, report and their findings, uh, of which I will note uh, show that the applicant meets all of the conditions for under the Land Development Code, and they recommend approval of this conditional use. Um, we have with me uh, the landowner and his professional engineer. And we would ask, Mr. Chairman, if it pleases the board, that we would be allowed a time in rebuttal uh, after the staff and after we hear from the public and any of those in opposition uh, to come back for you to uh, present that, any rebuttal evidence, and to have an opportunity for a summary. Absol Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. Yes, sir. Any questions of Mr. Dunaway before we have staff's presentation? Thank you, staff. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Andrew Holmer, Scambia County Development Services Department. It's conditional use case, CU 2022-04. This is our location map. This is the 500 foot radius map showing the zoning on site as agriculture. Future land use map for the site is rural community. This is an aerial map uh, and included on this aerial outlined in red is the parcel in question and also added the 2006 National Wetlands Inventory layer on top of that. As you can see, there are indications of wetlands off to the west of the site. Um, there's a creek along there. This is a public hearing sign that was posted on site. This is looking north along Highway 95A. This is looking south along 95A uh, at the entrance. This is looking west across Highway 95A to the entrance to the property. That's it. Um, all right, as to staff findings, um, Mr. Dunaway is correct in explaining um, the reason we're here um, because of that distance requirement um, that is found in 4-7.6B1F. It says, notwithstanding the uses listed for any zoning district, which this is an allowed use outright in ag, conditional use approval process shall be waived for any borrow pit or reclamation activity that is located a thousand feet on all sides from any residential use or zoning district and is serviced by an adjacent arterial or collector road. This proposed location does not meet that thousand foot requirement from residential uses. As to the specific criteria, criteria A, which is general compatibility. This proposed use is in an area of mixed residential and agricultural uses. As proposed, the operation will have higher buffering standards than those required by the Land Development Code. The increased buffering and strict adherence to the LDC requirements for hours of operation 
and dust suppression will allow for compatibility with adjacent uses uh, for the period of active mining. The proposed reclamation of the site is a lake and residential home. Criterion B, this is dealing with facilities and services. The services needed for the operation of a pit will be provided by the operator. As proposed, the operation will not need the use of a potable water supply or a sewage system. Information obtained by the applicant indicates that there are no public potable wells within 500 feet of the parcel. Criterion C, on-site circulation. A proposed driveway connection to North Highway 95A should be sufficient to service the proposed use. The trucks accessing the site would use the road in a similar manner as those servicing other pits and industrial sites in the area. Criterion D, nuisances and hazards. The nuisances associated with a mining operation can be alleviated through strict adherence to the development standards imposed by the LDC and the County Code of Ordinances, Chapter 42, during the active mining period. Criterion E, solid waste. Any solid waste services required will be provided by the operator. Criterion F, screening and buffering. The LDC contains use-specific setbacks, screening and buffering requirements in Section 7-4.6D. The proposed site plan shows a 25-foot natural vegetative buffer around most of the pit, widening to 50 feet on the southern border. This will be sub supplemented by fencing and additional plantings as required through the site plan review process. Criterion G, signs and lighting. The proposal for this pit details an entry sign with hours of operation and contact information. The only other signage will be no trespassing signs as directed by the LDC. No lighting is included in this proposal. H, site characteristics. The overall parcel size is 52.85 acres with 44 plus or minus acres proposed for the pit. The submitted site plan shows the pit centered on the wider portion of the parcel and uphill from the wetlands to the west. The site appears adequate for the use as proposed with the enhanced buffering. I, use requirements. These are the separate use requirements that some conditional uses have. These are the ones that are found in Chapter 4, Article 7, uh, specific to borrow pits and land clearing debris disposal sites. Staff finds that the proposal does meet those additional criteria as detailed in their submittal. And overall, staff findings, staff recommends approval of the conditional use as submitted with the enhanced buffering as detailed on the submitted site plan. Board members, any question of uh, staff at this point? Um, yes, I do. Okay. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And um, I don't know where to start. Okay. Well, let's go to the, the map that talks about the uh, wetlands to the west. Okay, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is this is 52 acres, 50, 52, 53 acres, and I think I read in there somewhere is they're going to have a 44 acre borrow pit that is going to turn into a 44 acre pond. next to wetlands and I don't understand how it's how you're going to fill this 44 acre hole and not affect surrounding wetlands or aquifers or what have you 
And that's, I know I was here the last time we, we mm -hmm. talked about it. And I think I asked uh, someone, how deep is the pot, how deep is the borrow pit going to go? And the gentleman said between 40 and 60 feet deep. So I'm trying to envision a 44 acre or 40 foot deep pit that will become a pond. That's a whole lot of water to fill. Uh, do do have we looked at environmentally how this is going to affect the surrounding wetlands? Do we know how far down water is in the area? Has there been any um, drilling on site to give us an idea of, you know, is there 60 feet of dirt that can be excavated? Um, th that's what I can't wrap my head around. Okay, so um, we have two separate things here. Um, today the applicant is coming requesting the land use itself uh, of the mineral extraction. A reclamation plan for the site, they're proposing to make it a lake. The reclamation does have to be approved through the BCC. Um, they have, I believe, a year after they get a development order to have that approved through the BCC as their official reclamation plan. The applicant's engineer is here. I'm not aware, nor have we requested at this point, just discussing the land use issues, uh, any sort of geotech report on that. They may have that, um, but at this point, we're specifically talking the land use itself. As you can see on the site plan, they have included buffering from the wetlands um, as delineated. On our map, what shows as wetlands is once again a 10,000 foot view, so to speak, the National Wetlands Inventory map. Um, not the most accurate thing in the world, but it does give indicators. If the wetlands, you know, you were to go out and walk it and delineate it, you're going to find other indicators, not just the soils, but the type of plants growing there. Um, you can see the contours on the site plan. It drops, the, the, the land slopes to that uh, western side. There is, there is a creek along there. Um, so all the excavation is going to have to stay not just out of the wetlands, but out of the buffer from them as well. Um, but once again, the, the required geotech for the lake um, is going to have to come at the time that the BCC were to approve that. I don't right. can't speak for them as to what they would vote for for a reclamation. Right, and and I mean, and that's my my concern is if we approve a borrow pit, we approve a hole, and I kind of want to know the whole story. I don't want them to come back later and say, okay, we got a hole now, we got to do something with it. Um, so I'm kind of, I know I'm putting the cart before the horse, but I'm, sure. it's still, it, a, it's an issue that I need to look at to allow the beginning to begin to know how the story's going to end. Correct. It's, it's a two-part thing. You know, right. Land use of extraction of the minerals and to the reclamation as approved through the BCC. What, I have another question. Sure. Um, and if I may go ahead. And you are absolutely correct. Horace Jones, Director for Development mm -hmm. Search Department. And, and, and as Drew stated, um, very, very accurately, um, the reclamation plan process is gonna be extremely detailed. Right. Very, very, they will have to, there are gonna be insurances, liabilities, everything that's governed by Another part of the that another part of the Scammy County Order of Chapter 82. DEP, Army Corps, all of those things will have to be involved. And their standards is that much more restricted than ours. And if and somehow or another, they cannot the liability, all of those things that gonna come with that, there's a million dollar things that gotta be submitted when it comes down for the reclamation plan process to make sure that there is no adverse impact whatever it requires. So, so you, you are very, very correct, Ms. Bass. 
but there are some stipulations, rules, and regulations in place that if they, they're going to have to meet them or not, there will be some severe. But at this point, it just, as you say, it's, it's, it's a little, I don't want to say premature, it's a very good question, but we, there's a second part to this that is extremely much more stringent if the board so pleased to, to decide to go <coughs> with that type of use. I know that may not be the exact answer that you may want, but that is the, there are some other process coming very, very detailed. Okay, let me ask you another way. When, when they go for their borrow pit permit, okay, I don't even know if that's a thing, yes. but um, when they go and they say, okay, I want to, to this, do this borrow pit, um, at that time, do they have to tell you what they're going to, how they're going to reclaim it? So all that's looked at at the same time, they don't have to come back and go, okay, now that you got a hole, what are you going to do with it? Well, it is, there is a county, they will, they will receive a county resource extraction permit for the extracting dirt. When they get ready to start claiming, we're going to be monitored. Then when they get to that point, they're going to have to come back. Yeah, they can give us an idea, but all those reclamation processes got to be approved by the board. Whatever it, it, it got but to. But they've already dug the hole. That's the that's where the ordinance is written at this time because and it's it's a special project condition that right now we're not guaranteeing no type of reclamation process at the time of the issuance of the county resource extraction permit. I mean that's the that's the ordinance way that it works at this time. Okay, at the time that they start digging the hole. Are they, or I'm sorry, it, uh, when they request the borrow pit permit, will environmental get involved at that time? Jim. Could, could I ask a naive question? Uh, I'm Philip Bates. I represent one of the opponents. I'm trying to figure out, are we still hearing from staff, or is this supplementing this staff report? I don't know this gentleman. That's why I asked. He, he, he We're still with staff at this time, and you are Jerry Maguire? No, he's not. What's <laughs> 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 um, uh, Tim Day, Deputy Director, uh, Natural Resources Management for the county. Oh, okay. Uh, so, kind of two parts. Um, so, through the review process, they do propose uh, how they want to reclaim the property. The reason that's important is how they intend to reclaim it will drive, as they do the excavation, what are your slopes? Right. You know, for example, you know, it wouldn't be allowed in this location, but if, say, it was construction demolition debris, they would propose something that would have more vertical slopes so that they build the cells so they, so it's, the, 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 the excavation plan is driven by how they intend to reclaim it. Okay. The confusion is, is we don't guarantee that's how the county will let you reclaim it un until you start to move forward. And part of that is on large sites, um, let's, let's say you've got a 10 or 15 year build out on digging it out. You may have changes in the community around it where there may not be a desire to approve what you had originally proposed. Right. So it's, so I apologize for the double speak of the code for that, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's the rules we have. Um, secondarily, your, your question about water, um, I haven't specifically reviewed this site, nor have we seen any geotechnical. However, along that western side, the, the presence of those wetlands indicates, you know, you've got water table within 12 inches of the ground at least three weeks out of the growing season. So in theory, somewhere around that level, once you get below it a little bit, you may be able to encounter uh, the, the water table and you wouldn't necessarily be filling the pond, but that's where the, the ground level would be expected to be. Well, uh, yeah, so when you when you dig a hole next to a wetland, are you not consequently disturbing that wetland? It, so water management district will also be a primary reviewer for it. Um, typically in these cases, if you leave somewhere between 25 and 50 feet off the wetland edge, Parts you got to remember if it's if it's true water table, 
when you dig down, you just expose the water table. If you're not draining the wetlands, you're not. Okay. Um, but it's going to require, you know, seeing geotech to see if, say, there's a restraining layer, you know, 10 or 15 feet. But it's um, that process the county doesn't have specific codes for, uh, but it is regulated by the state. So it's there'll be a, a review by the Northwest Florida Water Management District. Will it? Okay. Is is the wetland? You don't know. I don't know if you could tell me this. Is the wetland that is to the west? Is it a state or federal wetlands? It would be both oh. state, federal, and county regulated. Okay. Um, okay. Um, there just just seems like a lot of unknowns. Um, okay. My, my next question, I guess, for, for county is the screening and buffering requirements, and I understand that they've uh, exceeded uh, what is required for the borrow pit to exist. However, once the borrow pit is no longer classified as a borrow pit, do those screening and buffering go away? So the screening and buffering is for the activity of mineral extraction. Um, the current use abutting the other uses in the area doesn't require screening. Um, the natural stuff that's planted is and going to be enhanced is required because of the mining activity. At the end of the mining activity, our code does not call for a residential use next to a residential use to have buffering. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, Mr. Dunaway alluded to the fact that um, that they've come back with a different site plan. Can you tell me what the difference is from the previous time that they were here? Yes, ma'am. Um, as, you, as you're aware, last time they came through, there were staff concerns, um, just given the situation that this is more of a mixed area where you do have agricultural operations, but you also have um, residential uses in around there. Um, concerns before were with the minimum standards, okay? Um, when projects come through, if they meet our minimum standards, we have to push them through. Um, as this is a a conditional use and staff can insert an opinion in it, which we did uh, first time around, we wanted more than just the minimum. And this time around, they have provided that. Okay. Uh, do you know if this site had uh, was farmed previously? Just looking at historic aerials, it was farmed. At one point, it was civiculture. Um, and there was some mining in the southeast corner at one point in time. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a, some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, the county has not had, how should I put it, the most successful uh, track record when it comes to managing these pits. I think that's a fair statement. And if my memory serves me, not in the too distant past, we had a situation, I believe it was maybe in Cantoma, where we had a borrow pit and the person or the company was going to turn it into a residence and dig a pond. And that created a great deal of, of unhappiness and ill feeling in the, the community. I don't know if you recall that, and my memory's fuzzy about it, but the, the point that I'm making is, is that a part of the application, it says this will be become a private residence. It's my understanding number one, and just in passing, that it's an LLC that's applying. Am I correct? 
You are correct. Um, and number two is, and again, this is the application. How do we know what facts do we have to support the contention? This indeed is going to be uh, become a private residence and a pond. So oh, is, and it's written down. Is sure. there any documentary evidence or anything? Because you know we've sort of heard that story before. Okay, so two things. Let me let me answer the the, the two issues. Um, one, as far as reclamation, we've discussed the overall reclamation has to be blessed through the BCC. Um, they've the paperwork they've turned in, they've indicated that that is their plan, is a lake and a private residence on site. We don't have a building permit for a house on site because that's that would be down the road. Um, nor do we have anything that says this is not what they're going to do. Okay, we're, we are given the information we're given and go from that. Um, you're correct that the county has some history with uh, pit operations. I hope everyone will recall um, following the April 2014 flood and some of the issues with that, the county did a complete overhaul. The commissioners wanted us to completely overhaul the regulations concerning pits and reclamation activities. We have much more stringent standards, inspections, all the things we didn't have in the past, um, and that was that was driven by your county commissioners who said enough's enough. We need to have some higher standards, and you know, things like this. This wouldn't have come to this board. Uh, the one you had mentioned back in the day of a pond, that never came to the the BOA or to the BCC. That back then the rules were different. They have been changed, and now they have more oversight. So we really don't have any uh, documentary evidence other than the assertion in the application. This is indeed that it will convert into a, uh, a private residence and a pond. It's, it's, that's pretty much Correct. what Correct. I gather. Yes, sir. And can we go back to the criteria? Sure. If you would blow it up, then my poor eyes are not what they once were. Uh, thank you. Uh, go on down to nuisances and uh, there we go. There you go. I've, I, when I read this, the finding of fact in Criterion D, it is a blanket, uh, unequivocal statement that the nuisances associated with a mining operation can be alleviated through strict adherence to the development standards imposed by the LDC and county code during the active mining period. How? How can the staff make that assertion? That's an, as I say, an unequivocal statement. And given the past record of these borrow pit operations, even the ones that we have now, look at Rolling Hills, for example, uh, or some of the others in that area, I do not understand how the staff was able to find that it is uh, just, as I say, unequivocally, this will uh, uh, be fine. Do you understand what I'm... I'm and, and can I follow that up with, because I too have that question, with there's gonna be no water or sewer on the site, what are they going to use as uh, they said a uh, dust suppression system to be used? Can I, can I also, uh, I want to add to that. 
Um, do y'all have a better like view of the area? Because what I'm picturing in my mind from actually, um, you know, visiting a site a time or two, um, I think it's hard for them to actually actually picture what's going on in that area. I mean, it's, I mean, could that be explained by someone in more detail to the board? Willie, so, really, I, I believe you recused yourself. Didn't you I restrained from voting, um, but I didn't. I didn't restrain from uh, commenting or anything. I mean, that's according. I mean, I filled out a form. You know, it allows me to comment but not vote. If that makes sense. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first, I, I, I and I appreciate my colleagues' comments, uh, but I'd like to hear how we know for sure. This is a ledge pipe cinch. If we grant this, there's not going to be any nuisance problems. How do we know that? Okay. In the criterion, you will, let, me, let me read it out to you. The nuisances associated with a mining operation can be alleviated through strict adherence to the development standards imposed by the LDC and the County Code of Ordinances Chapter 42 during the active mining period. Our code gives us the buffering standards and whatnot. Those are designed, buffering by its very nature is designed to alleviate the impact from one use from an, between two uses, dis disparate uses. You've gotta have that buffering to alleviate any impacts. Given the rules that we have for any any kind of use, staff can say you have to meet these buffer standards. We can inspect it and make sure it meets it. Those standards are imposed for alleviating nuisances. There is no use proposed anywhere in the county. That's right that the county staff can guarantee anything on. If someone follows our requirements that we have, and these are the only ones we have, in this case, they're offering to go above those. Those are, by design, are to alleviate impacts. It's, it's no different, well, similar to your question about a private residence on site and why would the staff accept someone's written statement that that's what they want to do uh, where's the guarantee we don't have a guarantee we don't have a guarantee that they're not going to do a house when it comes to is a land a decision of would we recommend approval or not of a specific land use we have to work within the parameters of our code what do we have that is designed to alleviate impacts. Okay, we have these different buffering standards. We don't have a method to say, well, we're gonna have tell you to meet our standards, but we're just gonna throw those out and say it doesn't matter if you meet our standards. Okay, appeals go both ways. Um, if project comes through development review and meets the minimum standards, and staff was to say, you know what? We just don't like it, okay? There's our arbitrary decision, and we're right back here in front of you as if we were when a project comes through and someone else doesn't like it, even though it meets the minimum standards. We, we have our standards. That's what we're constrained to. Um, you know, people come in, submit plans for our house. Okay, well, if someone doesn't like that, they can say, well, I don't think that's what's going to be built. Your staff only has what is submitted. And, 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 and if I may do a very good point, Mr. Godwin, as you stated, um, in 2014, 2013, I was involved with the extensive, extensive Tim Day, myself, and other staff members with extensive overwrite 
overhaul of chapter 42 and chapter 82, I never get that time back again. <laughs> never. It was very extensive because of the, I don't want to say, because of the, the, the past, the past. And the BCC was adamant, no more. We're going to tighten up our standards. And they, 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 they did. They added chapter 42, which you don't have before you. That those requirements that governs borrower pits, they was overhauled completely. The land development code. Now, some of the things that we currently have in place because of the massive overall changes. Now we have site inspections that they go out there yearly. And if, and, and if something is going on, that the citizens, if it is approved, it's overall general. They call corner form, they call my staff. For example, if there's any impact to that buffering requirement, that buffering got to stay there. If there's any impacts, signage got to be up. Fencing got to be up. If there's any impacts, whoever the, whoever the owner of the borrower pit is or whatever these adverse facilities, they got to make some major adjustments. Our operations are completely posted. There's a there's a dust suppression plan that they got to submit and they got to keep there to help minimize the dust, the dust suppression and all those things. Those things are in place. Of course, as you stated, the words alleviate. We might as well. There will be some 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 adverse impacts. No, no doubts about it. But with these things that the county has in place. And with our inspection and with the citizens, they can call and there's if it's approved. There were there are out of fines, penalties, some major adjustments, code enforcement fines that we have put in place to help minimize, alleviate, uh, 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 so that we won't have the sins of the past occurring again. So there are things in place in my department, code enforcement, we yearly, they gotta do, they gotta do affidavits that they gotta submit yearly indicating this what you have done. So, so it's very, very more stringent now because the BCC, the Board of Condominiums said no more. Let's overhaul because of that issue and, and, and they did. And of course you still gonna have bad actors but they are, the protocols are now in place and they're being enforced. One, one other question. Uh, do they necessarily have to make this into a lay? Uh, it, can it be used for uh, debris? Uh, I think, let me put it this way. Much more scrutinized you start doing that, you're going to open up. There's another whole other section, chapter 82. And, and I'm telling you, the standards are much more. When you start bringing in land claim debris or other, those stuff that, that would cause the problem back then, well, it, it's going to be very, very so. So they cannot change in midstream and say, if not, there are going to be some problems with that. Yes, sir. So in other words, if this application is approved, then once the borrow pit has been exhausted, then it has to become a lake. It can't be diverted into the, in other words, they're forestalled from attempting to use it as yes, any sir. kind of debris yes, kit. Is that a pit? Is that my sir. understanding? Once again, trying to explain the, the, the two-part thing we're dealing with here. They're proposing a lake. Um, the reclamation plan, the, the final reclamation of any excavated area uh, that comes through for permitting is in the hands of the BCC. Now, without all the geotech, we don't know. If, Something could come up in the geotech that says, you know what, you can't use it as a lake. You just need to smooth down the sides and just make it a, a, a let it grow back and be a depression in the ground. We do not have that information. Today, they're not seeking a reclamation plan. They're telling you what their proposal for the reclamation plan is. End of the day, that is in the hands of the county commission, not 
the staff or the Board of Adjustment. Chairman, I think that's my. I have a couple of questions. Uh, Drew, yes, sir. You, would you scroll um, up to the top of findings of fact for a moment? Um, there you go. Thank you. Um, I recall that there was questions about um, the distances, the thousand uh, foot um, from the past application. Um, and there were some questions about uh, wells on those residential properties surrounding this area? Yes, that, that's a separate issue. I, I have a feeling some, uh, some attorneys are gonna get into on the, mm -hmm. for you here in just a bit. Um, as far as the, the conditional use that we're here for, it, it's this <laughs> section right here discussing how far it is away, a thousand feet from residential uses and zoning. Um, there's no question at all about the measurements. There are residential uses well within the thousand feet from the, the boundary of this. Okay. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And with that, it has nothing to do with the size of the pit. Correct. Board members, any, any additional questions of staff, any staff? Applicant, would you like to ask any questions of staff at this time? You'll have an opportunity to summarize and uh, ask questions later, but if you have any now on regarding what's just been discussed, please address it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would in response to um, um, Mr. Shack's uh, question, I would ask uh, Mr. Homer if he could clarify that if this were an, well, I'm going to let him finish talking Mr. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So I would just ask um, Mr. Holmer if he would clarify that uh, because this is a permitted use in ag, if this were a situation in which there were no residents within a thousand feet, we wouldn't actually be here before the board because this would be approved already, correct? Yes, sir. It's right there in that criteria where it says that the conditional use process shall be waived for any borrow pit, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, the reason we are here for this conditional use for the BOA is because there was someone who bought, built a house on an ag um, zoned area that's just south of this parcel and other uh, residential zoning in that within a thousand feet, correct? Correct. Those pre-existing residential uses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. I have a question for Mr. Dunaway. Um, have y'all done any any geotech, any borings? Do you know what's down there? Do you know how how big how deep the pit's going to be? And Ms. Bass, I can uh, uh, call our engineer to answer that question. I can either do that now or I can do that as I had planned uh, in the summary after the comments from the public. Okay, I can wait. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We have some uh, speakers. I will ask you to. Uh, do we have the right to cross the staff? Absolutely, absolutely, sir. I didn't know if this was the time or later when you were talking about other speakers. That's okay. what I asked. We'll come to the mic. State your name again, please. My name is Philip Bates. I represent uh, Mr. Connors and his company, who were the landowners, the residential landowners to the immediate south of this site. Mr. Mr. Bates, could you, if we can bring up a map, can you show us where your client's property is? Where, where the cursor is on your screen, yes. it's showing. Is it, is it the entire section there, or? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hundred eight acres. I'm sorry. How much? How many acres are we talking about? One hundred and eight acres, directly south of the pit proposed site. For the record, one hundred and eight acres directly south of the pit site. And. The, I see some homes on the left of Bean Road. Are those included in this 
in the, your clients. Let me, let me just take a moment of house cleaning here. Mr. Connors, were you sworn? Uh, no, sir. Not yet. I, I think he's my client and I'm, he's helping me answer. Okay. Yeah, that's Mr. no Goddard's problem, question. but we would need to swear him if uh, you, of course, don't need swearing, but we need to we'll swear. We'll get there. I'm just trying to expedite answering Mr. Godwin's let's, questions. Let's swear him. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I could help you with the map since I'm already sworn in. Okay. Do you solemnly swear and affirm the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I hope you have. Thank you. 188. Thank, right? thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption, sir. Uh, with respect to the staff, I, I'm sorry, I, I was 12 before I could remember my own name. I missed your Andrew Holmer, H-O-L-M-E-R. Mr. Holmer, uh, were you uh, on the staff a year ago? Yes, sir. Okay. Pardon me? Go ahead. I'm just... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, when uh, did this current application come to your attention? I don't know exactly what date it was submitted. I could look that up. Uh, it's within the past two months, probably, to meet the deadlines. Have you and I ever met or talked? We spoke at the last hearing, yes, sir. Other than at the last hearing? No, no, sir. Have you and I ever met or spoken about this particular application? No, sir. Have you met with or talked with my client, Mr. Connors, about this application? This particular application, no. Okay. Have you met with uh, Mr. Dunaway or his client regarding this application? Yes. Okay. With respect to this application, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Is this going to be a storm drainage pond or a reclamation pond or a lake? Because both things appear in the record. Okay. So when we say reclamation, the reclamation is the plan as approved through the county commissioners. What they are proposing is a lake. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the exhibit that's attached to their application. Okay. And it says something different. My recollection is that it says retain each pond. Is that not correct? Could you? I'm sorry, I mean, we could pull it up on the screen if you'd like. I think if you look at Exhibit B to their application, it says future stormwater retention. It does say that right there. So yes, we sir. don't know whether it's going to be a lake, a stormwater retention, or anything else at this point. Correct. As we discussed, we don't have the geotech on that or the approved reclamation. How many residents around this particular area, let's say within uh, less than a, a quarter mile? I would have to count them to tell you more than one or two right absolutely yes sir have you talked to any of those residents or has the county staff done any inquiry with respect to those residents regarding this application no sir we're required to uh, meet our publication requirements and we did so we have had some phone calls come in but I can't recall if anyone told me they live directly adjacent well, I mean you did meet with the applicant and his counsel I'm just curious if sure. you met with anyone else who might have a different point of view no sir okay do you recall the findings from uh, a year ago or a year and a month ago with respect to the plan that was submitted then? Sure. Do you need me to pull those up? We can access them for you if you need them. Well, it, at uh, the first page of the March 17, 2021 report, staff said, dust suppression and limited hours of operation can diminish some of the incompatibility. Mm -hmm but cannot resolve the issues inherent in the limited distance from homes. Do you remember that? I'm going to pull it right now. <laughs> it, 
it's under findings of fact criteria a it's on the first page okay. of staff's report of which you were a part yes sir. to this board a year ago yes sir let me pull that up It's a one of my exhibits. I don't know if it's. Yeah. There we go. If you scroll down about two thirds of the way down the page. <laughs> A. There it is. There we go. Cannot resolve the issues inherent in the limited distance from the homes. You see that? Yes, sir. What has changed? They've backed off further by increasing their buffering distance from the homes. Has, has, the, has the pit changed site? The pit is still going to be there, right? It's proposed for the, yes, same parcel. Okay, mm -hmm. So the same parcel in the same location and you just designated additional buffering zone, is that right? Yes, sir. Now, there was something about dust. What is the dust control going to be? I don't have the uh, that submitted as part of this project. They're going to have to submit that as development, part of development review should they get land use approval. Are you familiar with the conditional use definition in the land development code? Yes, sir. It says, a use that, because of its special requirements or characteristics, may be allowed in a particular zoning district on a specific site only after the board of And how is it that without any notion of what the specific dust control is going to be, that you are certain, unlike last year, that there will not be any adverse impact on the adjoining or associated residences? I don't believe I said there wouldn't be any adverse impacts. I did say the impacts can be alleviated, sorry, in the findings for this one, can be alleviated. It says in your report, the increased buffering and strict adherence for hours of operation and dust suppression will allow for compatibility with adjacent uses for the, act for the period of active mining. What is the dust suppression that you're relying on there for staff to change its recommendation from last year? Okay, so it's a simple question. Sure, sure. Uh, the increased buffering. They are not proposing any sort of water supply at this point. That was not included. The increased buffering, vegetative buffering, spreads out that distance. But the pit's the same size, is it not? The pit is the same size. It and has the more buffering. Will continue from that same location. Yes. And what is the what is the difference other than this additional lined off area which you're going to call buffering that is the difference <clears throat> when you determine compatibility with adjoining residences mm -hmm. does adjoining residents water supply impact your analysis Yes. Okay. Have you analyzed the extent to which a 40 foot to 60 foot pit on this property, which adjoins my client's property and Ms. Uh, Ms. Dortch's property to the north, how that will affect any wells they have on their properties? Public potable supply wells is what we regulate by oh I know that okay. but you are have the larger obligation with respect to whether this impacts adjoining residential use is drinking water a residential use well it depends do they have an uh, are they using a drinking well or are they have an account with a local, local water provider 
And once again, we don't have the geotech on the uh, aquifers and everything else underneath this, the soil. You all were told that a particular provision of the Land Development Code applies only to public potable drinking wells. Is that the only provision in that code that applies to wells? I would have to look it up and see. Do you contend that if my client or Ms. Dorch have wells on their property that they use for drinking water and for watering their livestock and for irrigating their property and their um, growing crops, do you contend that because it's not a public, private, potable water supply licensed and operated by uh, some licensed water provider, that it can be disregarded entirely in terms of the effect or consequence of this borrow pit on that feature of the adjoining residences? Without the geotech outlining the aquifer, I'm not a geologist, I can't make a guess as to this, a hole in the ground that water absorbs down into the aquifer as it currently does, um, I simply don't have anything to review that with. Aren't you charged with determining whether or not this proposed use, this conditional use, impacts adjoining residences? Yes, sir. This land and that's use. that's not part of your analysis? Not to that technical specification. No, sir, it's not. Not technical. Just a question. Did anybody consider it? No, we're not at that point. But the board has mm -hmm. got to approve a conditional use being certain that it is compatible with surrounding existing or permitted uses. Yes. And you're not giving them any help on that point. Not without a geotech report, I can't tell you. Who supervises compliance with the supposed assurances of good management practices and dust control and noise control in place by your findings with respect to this application? If they were to be approved and it were to go through development review and if they got an approved development order, we have to go out and make sure once they get approved we have site inspectors that go out and make sure is, is something built to the requirements. Does it have what it's supposed to have as far as fencing, things like that. Uh, the county also does yearly inspections between our department and code enforcement of all the pits. What specific facts does staff have for this board about screening and buffering? the plan that's submitted. They said they would screen and buffer. Yes. And that's your facts, your competent substantial evidence to persuade the board that there will be no impact on the adjoining residential use. You'll notice the recommendation um, does include that they have to meet the standards of the plan they have submitted. That's where that increased buffering is shown. And the increased buffering is nothing more than some additional distance that you've drawn on a map. Distance Did that already existed. Planted in addition to the natural vegetation and fenced. Have you been to this site? Just to the entrance. Pardon me? Just to the entrance, I posted the sign. Have you been up to Ms. Dorch's property to see what her view of this particular project is going to be? No, sir. I see. So you don't know what it is they plan on planting, or how soon or how long it will take for that to grow, you have just taken their word that they're going to have screening and buffering, and that is what you expect this board to rely on for purposes of determining whether or not this is going to be compatible with people's homes where they live. So the specifics of the planting is gonna to have to come through at the development review stage. Not at the determining of whether or not this is a compatible use stage? The land use. The performance standards come at the development review stage. Would it, do you know if 
this adjoining wetlands is uh, tied to the aquifer? I would assume so. And do you know whether a 40 or 60 foot, 40 acre hole in the ground is going to affect that? I would need a geotech report that falls at that performance standard phase. Yes, sir. There may be an aqua clue. I don't know where it would be. Do you know how many private wells in this area may be affected by a 40 acre, 40 to 60 foot deep pit on this particular site? I do not have that information. So you don't know today whether this is compatible with adjoining residential use? That is not under our review. You don't know? Sure. But you want the board to make a decision that says it is compatible? Yes, I can't go beyond our code and what we're tasked. Your code tasks you with determining whether or not it's a consistent and compatible use. Yes. But you don't know. Specifics on private wells, no, I do not. And you don't know how effective the buffering will be in terms of what's going to be planted because it hasn't been planted. You don't even know how much has to be planted because you haven't looked. I don't have the information submitted. It, this isn't the performance standard stage. The performance standard is compatibility, is it not? Isn't that yes. what the Land Development Code says? Mm -hmm. But you are asking this board to just hope that it's compatible in these areas where you haven't been able to make any determination? Once again, we're at the land use stage. When we make a recommendation, it's going to be, if it goes through development review, which this has to, this is not the development review stage. Then why are we here? For the land use. The land use, which has to be compatible. And you're charged with determining and advising this board as an expert yes. about compatibility. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that doesn't matter because somebody else is going to look at this later on. So why are we here? We're here discussing the land use issue itself, just that. And according to the board, it's compatibility. Yes. Okay. Can it be compatible? And you don't know. I'm saying it can. I see as part of this application a graph or depiction of future land use. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? I certainly am. And in less than eight years, is the land use going to prohibit a borrow pit adjoining a residential use? Does rural community future land use allow for that use? Yes, it does. Each each future land use designation has zoning districts allowed underneath it that enforce the goals, objectives, and policies of our comp, comp plan through the future land use. Under the, the zonings allowed under rural community, one of those is ag, which this is, and a borrow pit is an allowed outright use. We're here because of the distance requirement. The future land code says that borrow pits will be prohibited near existing residential uses. And that's an exhibit that I will get to in a minute. Sure. Will be prohibited. So we won't be having this hearing eight years from now if this becomes effective, right? I have no guarantee what will happen in the future going forward with our relations with the state as far as making any changes to our future land use or zoning districts. Let's go back to the findings of fact from a year ago okay. that you proposed, where one of the findings of your staff went this way. The nuisances associated with a mining operation can be alleviated through development standards, but not all impacts on adjacent residential uses can be avoided. Do you see that? Or do you remember that? Yes, it's in there. What impacts cannot be avoided? The fact that there will be a hole in the ground, it's not, it's going to, you know, if it gets approved, there will be a hole in the ground, yes. Uh, how, what impact on adjoining residences is there from a mining operation less than 500 feet from their back door? 
while it's an active operation, sure, there's going to be machinery working on site. How long will it operate? I do not have their mining schedule. Okay, so you don't know. I do not. That's Once market again, you dependent. don't know how much of an impact there will be on adjoining residences. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know how long this is going to go on. Correct. Could be four years, could it? I don't know. Could be ten years? I don't know. You don't know. No. But you want the board to find that it's compatible with adjoining residential uses? Yes. <laughs> the finding of fact, pardon me, it is there this time on the same issue says, the nuisances associated with a mining operation can be alleviated through strict adherence to the development standards imposed by the Land Development Code and the County Code of Ordinances, Chapter 42, during the active mining period. Yes. But you did not, this time, include the phrase about impacts on adjacent residential uses cannot be avoided. Why is that? they enhance the buffering standards. I look each each application totally separate. The buffering standard alone costs you to say that there won't be any impact on adjoining residences. The entire purpose of buffering standards is to alleviate impacts, yes sir. But you don't know how long it will go on. Correct. You don't know how it will affect their private wells. You don't know how much dust or noise will be there. You do acknowledge there will be dust or noise. You just don't know what it'll be for a year, four years, 10 years, whenever. And you don't know at the end of the time what's gonna happen with this 40 acre, 40 foot to 60 foot hole in the ground in terms of whether it's gonna be a stormwater retention, a lake. Maybe there will be a residence there. We don't know. They said they'll do that. We don't have any idea for sure. All that is correct, is it not? We are relying on what's submitted, yes, sir. Okay, what about financial ability to reclaim this particular parcel? Not one of our criteria. Does the reclamation of this parcel affect its compatibility with adjoining landowners and residences? That's why that decision is in the hands of the BCC. No, the Board of Adjustment is supposed to determine whether this is compatible with adjoining uses. Yes. Okay. Not just adjoining uses compatibility today, not just compatibility two years from now, but compatibility for the project. Isn't that correct? Compatibility with the land use, which is mineral extraction that's proposed. It says compatibility with surrounding existing or permitted uses. Mm -hmm. Is a residence a permitted use? Yes. And you're telling us that you do not know today whether this will be compatible with residential uses, which are permitted, you just want us to assume that it will because you don't know how long it's going to be in play. You don't know for sure how e effective any of this buffering is going to be. You haven't even looked to see where it's going to be. You don't know the effect on the wells or the wetlands. You just want this board to conclude based on your bold conclusion that this is not going to be a problem for the adjoining landowners such that the board should vote no. I'm sorry, was that a question? It I'm sorry, did you answer? No, I'm sorry, were you asking that as a question? It was more of a statement. With, without any specific or ultimate facts, just the conclusion you think it's gonna be okay, is what you're asking this board to agree with. Within the boundary of what I'm allowed to address, yes, sir. Uh, so when you say it is going to be compatible with existing <coughs> surrounding permitted uses, that's your proof? Based on the submittal and the parameters that I can look at, yes, sir. But not based on everything that might apply? Not based on a bunch of unknowns that aren't a part of that review, yes, sir. Are you familiar with the Land Development Code? Somewhat, yes, sir. Are you familiar with the definitional section? Yes. We can pull that up if you'd like on the screen for everyone. If... Yeah. Well, let me just ask it this way. Would you please call up the definition of well? Sure. 
The definition well in the land development code definitions, it's under section 6-03, terms defined, 37 pages of definitions. Find the definition of well, please. Would you tell us where the definition of well appears? Yes, sir. I will pull that up and read it for you. You got it. Can you? Can you hit? We can't really make it any larger. Let me go ahead and read that for you. So I've got wellhead protection area, which falls between water-related uses and wetlands. I don't have specific well as a separate. Mm -hmm. No, sir. Wellhead protection area is the closest. The only. Is a wellhead protection area a well? No, sir, it's an area around a public potable. Okay, so we have no definition of well. That is correct. In the land development code, right? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. An issue came up a year ago with respect to wells, did it not? Yes, it did. And I understand that counsel for uh, the applicant mm -hmm. wrote to Horace Jones and Timothy Day asking for a definition of the term wells as used in 4-5.9 B3. Are you familiar with that inquiry? Yes, I am. Okay. Would you look at 4-5.9 B3 in the Land Development Code? Sorry, we've got it up on the screen. Which uh, section do you want? 4-5.9. Yes. You have that in front yes, of you? Yes, sir. We've, we've pulled it up here. Now, look at 4-5.9C. Mm -hmm. You see C? Yes, sir. Okay. Restrictions on development. Okay. 4-5.9B is what you all rendered an opinion on, is it not? I would have to pull up the uh, specific exhibit, but yes, sir. Okay. Does 4 dash, pardon me, does 4-5.9C have any particular requirements with respect to wells? Yes. Okay. Does it not, well, let me back up, is the particular site that we're talking about north of County Road 196? Yes, sir. Okay. C2, which is not within 4-5.9B, C2 says the following land uses are prohibited within the established seven-year travel time contour or within 500 foot radius of any well mm -hmm. north of County Road 196. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and then you go down to item C2F. It says borrow pits, does it not? It says mines, borrow pits, and other mineral resource extraction. How close is the well on Mr. Connor's property to this site? I don't have the exact measurement. I believe it's one of your exhibits, at least of the photo. You shown. don't know? No, sir. Okay, isn't it? If there is a well within 500 feet, is it not prohibited? The site, the borrow pit is prohibited? Public potable water supply. No, it doesn't say that. It says well. We already went through the definition of well, did we not? There isn't a definition of well. There isn't. So, you use the common definition, do you not? 
Let me, let me go back to the interpretive provisions of the Land Development Code. Is the subject heading to be part of the interpretation of the code? In other words, is the phrase at the top of 4-5.9 wellhead protection, is that an interpretive provision? It does not say, say that. Um, do you need the code section about interpretations? We I'm going to find it. Okay. Let me see if I can help. Does item C say that 500 foot radius of any public potable water supply well, or does it just say well? It just says well. Okay. You look down below and you see under item C references to drainage wells, do you not? Look at item H. Okay, it says drainage wells or other facilities which provide for the disposal of stormwater directly into the aquifer absent normal percolation. So this doesn't apply just to public potable water supply wells, it applies also to drainage wells, does it not? That's more commonly referred to as a sand chimney uh, with a stormwater pond, yes sir. Okay. Yes, the answer is yes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, how about injection control wells under K and L? It, it applies to those too, does it not? Correct. All right, so why then, if this is a requirement with respect to operation of borrow pits, when you are assessed with determining compatibility mm -hmm. with adjoining residences, why did your staff not address this particular concern? We have an interpretation that says that section applies to public potable wells, you supply have an interpretation wells. Interpretation with respect to 4-5.9B, do you not? I would have to pull the interpretation. It is one of the exhibits that was submitted. Because B says wellhead protection areas. C doesn't say anything about wellhead protection. So north of 196, we don't have the seven year, 20 year wellhead protection areas. Those are a. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, staff apparently has been persuaded by an interpretation of a different section applicable to wellheads, wellhead protection areas, and has disregarded the lowercase word well, W E L L, in disregarding the fact that this particular site, this particular borrow pit, is going to be within 500 feet of my client's well, less than 500 feet of Ms. Dortch's well, and nevertheless, you conclude, the staff concludes, without any evidence that I've heard yet, that it is compatible with adjoining residential uses. Isn't that what you've done? Yes. <coughs> Are the contours of this pit the same as proposed a year ago? I'd have to look at the earlier site plan. Well, I thought you said there was no difference except you, these alleged buffers. I don't remember if they had that. Are you referring to the elevation contours or the excavation contours? How many, let me ask you this. How many separate meetings did you have with representatives of the applicant regarding this staff finding? Two or three. Was, uh, was Mr. Patterson present? Yes. Okay. Was um, Ms. Bush present? Yes. Uh, Miss Bush used to be with the county attorney's office, did she not? Correct. Um, did she have any kind of role in the county attorney's office working with your staff with respect to land use matters prior to her departure? Yes. Okay. Do you have an opinion from her about what is the definition of a well? No. She is the one who asked for a definition under item B of that section. Interpretation, yes, sir. Okay. In fact, her actual letter referencing B is part of the submission package, is it not? Yes, sir. Where she says and frames the question, does the term wells within section 4-5.9 B3, wellhead protection, refer to public potable water supply wells? See that?
Yes, sir, that is what okay. it says. She does not ask for any sort of definition with respect to wells used generally in the next section of that statute or that land use development code provision. No, sir, just to the overall section. So staff decided that if 4-5.9B didn't apply, then they would disregard 4-5.9C. That follows it, yes. Again, I don't have quick access to it. I will represent to you that the Land Development Code tells us that titles on a particular section are not to be used in construing the section. Are you familiar with any of that? Vaguely. Okay. So the fact that the very top of that particular section says wellhead protection, that word means nothing in terms of interpreting this section. Is that correct? It applies to that entire section of the code. I'm not sure I understand. Okay, 1-1.11. One one one. Okay, let me pull that. At the very end of that, says, headings and titles. Headings and titles within the chapters of the Land Development Code, typically in boldface or italic type, are only included to indicate content and organization for the convenience of the reader. Such headings are only catchwords and do not by their presence or absence govern, limit, modify, or in any manner affect the scope, meaning, or intent of any provision of the Land Development Code. Do you see that? Yes, I'm reading it right now. So, have you read it? Yes, sir. I, I got so it on my screen. what is the significance here. of the title at the top of this particular section, Wellhead Protection? Protection of wellheads. Um, no, the significance I don't have of it. that you just read, it means nothing in terms of interpreting this particular section. Sure. It, it says what's below it. It's for reference, it doesn't interpret what's below it or qualify in any degree, does it? No, it just identifies where those standards are. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. So, item A, protection is required for the protection of public health, safety, welfare, and use, and storage of del deleterious substances and contaminants which may impair present and future public potable water supply wells. You see that? Yes, and okay. well fields. So, we're not, but we're not talking about public potable water supply wells as they use that phrase in item A. It, that is what it says in A. Well, but the word wells is qualified with the phrase public potable water supply wells in A. Yes, that's what okay. I'm saying. It's in there. In B, there is the language, wellhead point of withdrawal. You see that? Mm hmm Okay. But on, under item C, it says any well. Mr. Uh, Chairman, three or C. I'm sorry, Mr. Bates. I'm excuse, sorry. excuse me, just a second, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Mr. Homer isn't a lawyer. We're getting awfully deep now into statutory interpretation. I don't think it's quite appropriate that he be asked to uh, interpret in this particular instance. Uh, what a particular provision means legally. I think he can tell you what he thinks, but with all due respect to your in, uh, examination, uh, which I respect, I think we're getting a little bit of uh, far afield as far as what Mr. Homer knows legally it means what. So I would. He is if I could respond to you, sir, Mr. 
Mr. Godwin, he has been telling us that these wells don't matter. I am cross-examining this witness about the fact that the wells do matter and that they have disregarded it. I think I've made my point, and I'll leave it. Yes, sir. I believe that would be excellent. And if I may, Mr. Godwin, as I allowed Mr. Homer, which he does a very good job, I allowed him to do it, him and Mr. Godwin, to go back and forth. But you're right, Mr. Godwin. I am the one, I have the authority to make the interpretation with the help of Mr. Tim Day. And I know the cross-examination. I fully support the interpretation that was made based upon the information that was given by Mr. Tim Day. And so, but he presented his argument to you all. It's up to you all to make it. Now, like you said, I think we can move on because the interpretation's already made and it's in the record, so be it. Respectfully. And I'm not trying to disregard his argument at all. But it has been made. Not applicable to our circumstance. That's fine. Yes, sir. I think I'll end my cross-examination of staff. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I would imagine that there would be follow-up from Mr. Dunaway. Yeah, I just wonder, we'll probably do for a 10-minute break, but I wonder if Mr. Dunaway would like to make comments prior to that break. Mr. Chairman, if it pleases the board, I think that a 10-minute break is appropriate, and then I would suggest that we'd hear from the public. They've been here for quite some time. I would have, we'll be here as long as you're here, so that would be my suggestion. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, before we take the break, I've got a question that kind of pertains to Mr. Bates' questions, and I know that I saw Tim Day. My question is directed to Tim Day regarding something that came up. Can I ask that question real quick? Sure. Thanks for sticking around. What is a littoral shelf? It's, I mean, it's just generally the, typically the littoral area associated with rivers and creeks. What is it used for? From my perspective, you know, regulatory, we use it to help reduce nutrients entered in the streams and creeks to improve water quality, but it's a very highly important biological area. Is it typically something that is required on man-made ponds and lakes? If they're going to, so we'll use it in terms of stormwater ponds. If someone proposes a wet stormwater pond, so one that's meant to have a water table year-round, it's required because it's interfacing with the groundwater, and those plants will provide nutrient reduction so that you're reducing any potential contamination of the aquifer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ten-minute break, y'all.
some good things. Ninety-five A is going to be a dirt roof. It's going to be a powder black asphalt dirt roof. I've already got the numbers over here. Yeah. I'm just saying I got two rooms over there. And do you know what that wet language is? It's a common part of Jack Frank's Yeah. That needs to be brought up to a And that car, that skin, that car.
like this behind my eyes. I mean, it was a river wider than this building. It ain't deep. The potential to destroy the wetlands is great. Oh, absolutely. It could drain them. Yes, I do. Well, you're off the same aquifer I am. Yeah, yeah. Mine's only 80 to 90 feet. I don't know how to do it. Not necessarily. Yeah, they're shallow. I've got other wells and other places that are full. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Let's uh, please take your seats. I believe all parties agree that we should begin by uh, admitting the speakers who have signed up to speak. And I uh, will remind you to please uh, keep it to three minutes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't think they can hear you through your mic. Attention everyone, we can, attention everyone, we need to start please. I believe we're going to be here a good while. <laughs> Any more attorneys? We're going to be here a good while, so let's get started. Please limit your talk to three minutes. If, uh, if the party in front of you or ahead of you has already stated your uh, opinion and comments, just say that you concur. Uh, with the granting of the conditional use or you're opposed to it. And uh, we have several that have uh, uh, asked to be able to speak. And uh, let's begin with uh, Irvin Scott.
Mr. Scott, please state your name and address and be sworn in. Urgent Scott. Five three two one Jack Road, Molina, Florida. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. I just want to state for the record that I'm against the project. Uh, I know it's easy to call an area like Molino agricultural, but I've only been there in Scammy County for about 10 years. But I've seen Shack Road grow in that 10 years, and that area out there is starting to grow. I don't want to dirt pit out there in my neighborhood. It's easy to say that uh, it's agricultural, but residential is what, what it is, and that's what it's going to be 10 years from now. I don't want to dirt pit that just sitting there Say it's going to be a pond, say it's going to be whatever, storm water drainage or whatever. But 10 years from now, we got to look down the future. So I'm going to guess it's a big bit. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Any questions of Mr. Speaker? Calvin Dayton. Please state your name and address and be sworn, please. Um, Calvin Dixon, 9585 Cobble Brook Drive. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I first must say that I disapprove of the project. Um, based on just before even coming, I looked, and there will definitely be an adverse effect, uh, even with the uh, buffer that they have if you look at the pictures of it the area right beside it our my family property is 5280 highway 95 which is on both sides of the street so it's the red line the to the east the yellow line that whole section is my family property the buffer exceeds well over into that so what's going to stop us from being affected by that So considering that, um, that's going to be a problem, first off. Second, like he just said, five, maybe 10 years from now, that area is probably going to be predominantly residential. All right, uh, the building process for the area is continually moved farther, farther and farther out. And I guarantee that it's going to be there sooner than later. The next thing is for us, the roads, the maintenance on those roads are not up to par, in my opinion, for real. So when you have the, the big vehicles that are going to be coming in and out, who's going to pay for that maintenance? And how well is going to be maintained? Are they going to pay for it? Is that part of the, you know, what they're going to contribute? I mean, I just see that it's going to be a tremendous, you know, effect on everybody in the area. And so therefore, I clearly disapprove. Thank you, Cody. Any questions of the speaker? Thank you. No, sir. Thank you. Cody Panzik. How you doing, Chair? Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? I do. Thank you. State and your name. state your my, name and address. My name is Cody Panzik. I live at 5675 Highway 95A North. The biggest concerns is going to be the groundwater contamination and the surface water contamination as well, because there will be runoff into those wetlands. There's no way, boy, that we get heavy rains all the time. It's going to happen. The, the dust... It's going to be horrible for crops. It's going to be horrible for livestock. I have birds that do have sensitive <clears throat> respiratory systems. It will affect them. We have several people in the area that work from home. The noise pollution is a big thing to consider. Several people have to have video calls. That noise pollution in the background is going to be hindered on their job and their pay ultimately. The, the already damaged highway Going to get even more damage as was previously stated before. It's already not taken care of and is going to get worse and worse with that many trucks coming through a day. 
that's biggest things I have for you right now that hasn't already been previously stated. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's good. Any questions of the speaker? No questions. No questions. Thank you. Sharon Kite. Sharon Kite, I live at 5537 Highway 95A North. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Sophie God? I do. Thank you. I have currently lived in rep, rep relation to the pit for 31 years. Um, I feel that this will be, it will impact our family, raising my grandchildren. Um, we have crops, we have livestock. Um, there's a church, New Hope Primitive Baptist Church, that is right outside of the um, 2,500 foot radius that I believe you're required to send a car to, that has a cemetery there. Who's going to maintain and keep that cemetery, the dust, from settling on those graves and keeping them maintained? Um, where will the residential home be in relation to the pit they said it's I, I don't I think I heard 52 acre parcel with a 44 acre pit so where in relation to the pit would a home be the previous property owner Vicki Henderson um, bought that property to stop the original pit that's in the southwest corner that's there currently. She bought that property to stop it because she wanted farmland. She didn't want that in this area. And her husband has sold it to Mr. Patterson. Is he well within his rights of building based on what you said? Yes. But I also have a water well that waters mine. That wasn't mentioned by Mr. Connor's attorney. Um, on the flat there outside of the red on the left side third yellow box up <laughs> over <laughs> right above the pond right about the pond yeah. well, we're right. wrong pond or these yeah. Right. yeah thank you right there, there, there you go there, there. <laughs> i own that property and i own the property to the to the north of that um property so i'm concerned with noise because I've lived there 31 years, this is my home. I, I'm against this. Thank you. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none. Uh, Randy Wood. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, a question to the panel up here: uh, What positive effect will this have on the community? I don't see any. And I hope that, you know, can, I, can somebody respond back to me? Who has a positive uh, situation on this? There's none. It's all negative. I mean, it's going to hurt the community. Uh, as far as agriculture, it's not anymore. It's all residential. I've lived there 27 years. There used to be agriculture behind me. It's all houses now. And I live right off Shag on Rolling Oaks. They're getting ready to build a new subdivision on Molino Road, 39 units and there's other development going on constantly. This is a residential area. We already had a situation where people were shooting and stuff like that and you know we got involved in that. It's not, you know, it's not a rural area. It is residential now. And it's going to have such a tremendous uh, adverse effect. Uh, the, the wetlands is right uh, below me and the runoff naturally with the slope of the land going down to the runoff it's going to happen with the environmental uh, situation that's going on, the storms, some disaster is going to happen. It's going to cause a major impact to the wetlands. You know, we're supposed to be protecting these wetlands. Is this going to have an, an impact on down the road? You can't say no. It is going to have an impact. The, uh, the situation with the storms are getting worse. It's happening constantly. Look at the hurricane calendar that's coming up. The impact is going to be tremendous. It's not going to be positive. How can you reverse it? You can't. Once it's already implemented, we're screwed. 
That's pretty much the bottom line. I mean, we should be looking for the community, for the future, to help the residents, not hurt the residents. All I see here is hurt. That's it. Thank you, sir. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you. Eula May Ferris? Ferris, sorry. My name is Eula May Travis. My address is 876 Josh Lane, Molina, Florida. Please and I've been living in Molina 79 years. Ma'am, ma'am, you got to, you, you, you got to sweat your hand. I know you're ready. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, yes, and nothing I but the am. truth, so help you God? Well, you know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been staying in this area where this this guy is building this pond. I stay across the road down in the woods now. But I was born and raised about a block up from where Highway 95A to see the town road. The second house where the Smith stayed. I was born and raised there. I stayed I was born that November 6, 1942, and I left there October the 14th, 1968, and I bought that property down there where I stay at now, and I raised my children down there, and I had some before I got down there, but I'm against that building that pond right across there, and I know old lady Haber, the old lady that used to stay there when I was a little girl. And it's going to be snakes, rouse snakes, and rouse snakes over there. That's all ever been there. They was down, she was a German lady, and they was down in her cellar of her house. Anything I want to say? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions of the speaker? Robert, Robert McKillop. I live at 6088 Cedar Town Road, Molina. Please raise your right hand. Oh. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Just basically want to say that I'm totally in opposition of the, uh, of the, of the viral pit, pretty much for the same reason that everyone else has, has indicated. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jerry McGuire. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. McGuire is my um, engineer, and I was going to hold him for rebuttal if that's necessary. So, okay. Um, and the applicant uh, also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Philip Bates. You want to hear from me, sir? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we do. We heard from you. <laughs> I had some questions, Mr. <laughs> okay. We have about 15 to 20 who were here, signed, and did not sign to speak, do not want to speak. If Is there anyone who has changed their mind or I missed the call? Come forward and state your name and address and be sworn. My name is Michael Mack. My address is 2201 Nolan Faulkner Court, Cantonment. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. So me and my father purchased the property just to the west, 20, uh, 5400 Shag Road, less than a year ago. And quite frankly, we wouldn't have purchased it if we knew a pit was going here. It's a nuisance. Um, we don't want to hear dump trucks all day long, 12 hours a day, six days a week. It's, it's ridiculous that we would be allowed to put a pit near residences like this. Um, I have a question. Have any of you ever actually been to a borrow pit? Been Do where? you want to live within a thousand feet of one? Oh. I never thought about that. And, um, I couldn't answer that at this time. I own a dump trucking company, so, you know, been around dump trucks all and my you life. And you don't want to live near one. You don't want to hear dump. Have you ever heard a dump truck? Do you want to hear them 12 hours a day, six days a week? No. Exactly. 
So all of these points have been made. I understand we're not to the point where we're evaluating the environment. We're not to the point where we're looking at people's wells. We're not approving a pit. I get that. I understand it. But we are approving whether the land use is appropriate within a thousand feet of a residential area. That's that's what we're here for, correct? So do any of you want to live within a thousand feet of a pit? If somebody came to your backyard and tried to put a pit in, would you fight it? That's all we're here for. That is the entire purpose of why we're here. I think everybody's made it abundantly clear. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. There's, there's one person who wants it, and that's the guy who's going to make money from it. And hey, I get it. I want to make money too. Uh, I build, hey, I build homes for a living. I use borrow pits. I have no problem with a borrow pit. I do have a problem with a borrow pit within a thousand feet of a residential area. It's just not, it's, it's not acceptable. Do y'all have any questions for me? Thank you, sir. Any questions? Yes, we sir. Do I do have a question by the applicant. Uh, Mr. Mack, um, yes. on your house at uh, 5400 Shag? I don't have a house there. Okay. My, we purchased the property with the intention of putting in some cattle, some vegetable gardens, and my, my dad and I are going to build a homestead there. To the west. It, it, is it this right. part? Yes. yes. And then this part, so just to the north, uh, who is that? Who's? I don't, I'm not sure. Okay, that's your neighbor who has the house on the lake. Correct. Okay. And your area is vacant, mostly wetlands? Well, not mostly wetlands, but a good part of it is wetlands. Okay. I would say 10 of the 40 acres. No further questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else we missed or have changed your mind? Come forward, sir. Thank you. My name is Gene Church. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? I do. Thank you. My name's Gene Church. I actually live here in Pensacola, but I own property that shows up south of Sean Road, uh, right where that nice line that says uh, Aero Wetlands Map is. I've got uh, about 65 acres there with an, under an LLC by the name of Divine Mercy Farms. The reason that we called it that is because uh, our long-term plans are to build a retreat center. Um, the land is absolutely gorgeous. It's got a pond on it. It's quiet. It's serene. And even though it is in a growing residential area, I can stand out there and have relative quiet and peace. And, can, and so can others as we look at... Uh, at future use of constructing uh, a, a location on that property. The problem I have with what I'm hearing so far here is that everything that we're being told here is trust us. It's all going to, you know, it's going to turn out, we can't tell you anything, but just trust us. Everything's going to be okay. The problem is, I think we've reached a time in society that people are not very trusting about much of anything that anybody says. One of the things that we rely on when we have a board of adjustment is to look at the consistency of the land use plans that have been laid out and say, is this something that is consistent with growth? Occasionally something comes along that didn't meet, meet the exact lines and boundaries of what was intended when land use came along. But if it's close enough and it's for the benefit of the society as a, as a whole, then I think it's appropriate for you uh, as members of this board to say, you know, I think we can make changes because it's good for the good of society. It's good for the people in the community. It helps to build the development. It helps to make a more cohesive community. The problem I have with this isn't just a not in my backyard philosophy about this. It's a question of whether this is consistent with current land use as it's being developed and future land use. The reality is it is not. Uh, you know, do we have a need for strip pits? Yes. But there's a reason we don't have one in downtown Pensacola. There's a reason that we don't, that, that we moved the waste treatment plant from down by the water and moved it north in the county. It's because the circumstances and the environment warranted making changes that merited that. Now I say that to you because I look at this my property, Jack's Branch, cuts across it. Um, 
I look at the I look at this property, the massive amount of wetlands that runs through here, and I we can close our eyes and pretend that maybe nothing bad will happen. But the truth is it's because nobody gets held responsible if they're wrong. I just ask that you consider that when you're making your decision. Any questions? Seeing none. Is there anyone else? Paul Allen, Come forward. You might have put my I believe you're there. already sworn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do have a few questions. Have any of you members been on 95A lately? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I hate to interrupt, but I, I didn't get the address. Um, I, I heard you say you'd already been sworn. Was that on the other? Paul Alexander. 5050 Shag Road, Molino. Thank you. Again, any of y'all been on 95A in front of this place? There's school buses that goes up and down there. And the wetland, you know what that is? It's the beginning of Jack Brant Creek. My concern mainly is when they leave that pit and they go north and turn back onto Shag Road that's just been completely repaved, that's going to be a problem with the residents all the way down. If you'll enlarge that map a little bit. It's a this static is image. Property here. I'm in charge of this property. We both have wells. This gentleman right here has a swimming hole in his backyard that's a natural fed spring I believe if you cut that water line down because of a 40 to 60 foot pit you're going to lose that water out of that pond also do you know how deep it's going to be sir when they go down 40 60 feet how much of that dirt percentage wise being removed off the property don't, don't, uh, don't, don't, you're directing the board. Well, I'm asking. Well, if he, if he yeah. goes down 40 feet and removes 100%, that's 3 million cubic feet of dirt. 3 million cubic feet of 20 yards of dump truck load, that's 150,000 dump truck loads coming out of there. 150,000. 95A is going to be a powdered road if that happens. And that asphalt's already broken up. I don't even use 95A. I recommend my family not to even go out there, but I've got a granddaughter that has to go up that road on a school bus. Would you want your kids on a school bus going up a road that's completely broken up, which is already broken up without the dump trucks? I'm, all, I'm very concerned about the dump trucks going 95A, switching over to Shag Road to avoid 95A. But yes, I am against it. And everybody you, else sir. up there is against it. Thank you, sir. Maybe the board will be against it. Any questions of the speaker? Seeing none. No, is there anyone else? Raleigh Tremaine, I was up here this morning a little while ago. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said, and I'm totally against this as well. But one other point that hadn't been brought up yet with the wetland, concerning the wetland in that area, I believe I heard that there's a 54-acre parcel, and they're going to dig a 44-acre pond. How many acres is that wetland showing? It looks like pretty much everything that's not wetlands is going to be dug out of there. You might consider that when you... Uh, Make your decision here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions of the speaker? Anyone else? You wanted to speak? Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? I do. 
Thank you. I only have a couple of statements. If someone would pull up a map and pull up my residence, which is in the corner right there, pull up a thousand feet back to the south. The, this is just a static okay. photo of a map. Approximately a thousand feet from the red line. Pardon? I can't move. This is a picture of the map. Okay. Okay. Uh, a thousand feet from the red line on 95A. Go back to the west. I think you're going to find out that all of that covers a thousand feet. All the residents that are there is about a thousand feet from down into this piece of property. So I really don't know that the thousand feet should even be a question. And so far as the land, question earlier about how much there was drop in the land, my property from the front corner up at, on 95A to the back corner of my property where the back red line is at, it drops 12 feet. And when you start digging down, maybe eight or 10 feet, you can hit water. So, I would ask if you voted no, as you did in the meeting a year ago, and your memory is correct, as your statement you made earlier about voting against the pits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, question? I would like to ask a couple of questions. Yes, get to the mic, if you will, please. Ms. Dortz, do you have a well on your property? Sure do. Uh, do you use it for drinking water? Absolutely. Ms. Dortch, uh, do you have an unobstructed view of this parcel of property where the pit's gonna be from your house? Yes, I do. Is there anything that's between your view from your house and the pit other than grass? Not right now, except to the east. Mr. Patterson has built a new barn to the east, and in the mornings, about eight o'clock in the morning, I have to close my blinds on the east of my house because of the glow and glare from the, that barn reflecting back into my house. I can't see. Will this pit be very visible from your property? It's approximately 121 feet from my house to the property line. Thank you. I have a question for our speaker. Um, you said you have a well, is that correct? A drinking well on your property? How long have you lived where you are now? Uh, since 1998. Okay. And I built my house in 2000. Okay. When you, when you built your house in 2000, you installed a well, is that correct? Yeah. Or was one already there? I installed my well in 2001. Okay. My well was over 200 feet deep. Okay. That was my next question was how, how, deep was your well. Have you had to drill any since the beginning, since you? No. Okay. Thank you. South Africa, have any questions of the speaker? No, sir. Thank you. Would the staff like to make a closing statement? We're going to allow the applicant to make a closing statement and, and any remarks. Yes. I, have, I have an engineer that I hope would be able to testify. Um, I don't know how that would fit in. I think it would be before closing. Well, I think uh, any, is he considered an expert? He is, and his curriculum vitae is part of what we submitted to the board previously. Do we have any application for an expert on the file? We've worked with a specific individual through the county Yes, well, there would be zero objection on our end from that, and I do believe we qualified it. You qualified him as an, or accepted as an expert witness last time around. I'm, I'm pretty it's certain. It is correct. It be ties exhibit seven that we've submitted previously. And the think, applicant is uh, well think, familiar uh, with Mr. Merrill and has no objection. I think if we allow him to speak as a non expert for three minutes would there be any objection to that i think you can speak as an expert staff will staff work with him the development service department 
engineer so many projects. So staff would say basically that Mel Park is definitely an expert. He can present his credentials, but we work with him as an engineer on many, many site plan review projects. And hey. Chairman Smith, the applicant would agree. Yeah. We, sir? The applicant would agree that oh. Mr. Merrill is, uh, okay. can be a qualified uh, expert I, we, in the field you, of engineering. Thank you, sir. William Merrill, 1164, Finch Drive, Gulf Breeze, Florida. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and the <coughs> truth and nothing but the truth of the God? I do. Thank you. Mr. Merrill, you were engaged as an uh, engineer for Connors Realty Holdings and Mr. Connors? That's correct. Let me ask you some very quick questions. Uh, in the vicinity of this property, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm referring to our Exhibit 4, which is before you. Uh, how many residences are within this particular vicinity? And Mr. Okay. Chairman, um, if I could ask for clarification, because there was an indication that there were exhibits that are before you, but I, I don't know, I don't have those exhibits. Oh, I have them now, thank you. Okay. We can pull them on the uh, big screen if needed, so. You, within this exhibit four, um, I, I counted 28 residences. 28? 28. And how proximate are they to the borrow pit location? Uh, uh, some are as close as 100, 100 feet or less. Um, some are, you know, further, five, 600 feet. With respect to this site, did you prepare this exhibit? I did. How close is the water well that Ms. Dorch described to this property where the pit is going to be? Well, within the drawing, it shows a, a 500 foot radius and it shows that the, the, the pit's well inside of it. I can't remember the exact distance, but it's, it's around 200 feet from what I recall. And how about to the south, Mr. Connors well, how close is it to the pit? Uh, it, from his well, not his property line, which is real close, you know, it, it's, it's between 50 and 60 feet. Were both of these wells present a year ago? They were. And with respect to this application, what is different about this application this time as distinct from this application a year and a month ago? The differences that I saw were that along the south line, last time there was a 25 foot buffer, uh, now there's a 50 foot buffer. And it, it looks like they, they curved the, the southeast corner of the pond, um, put a radius on it, which moved it back just a little bit. How much? Uh, feet, um, I couldn't say exactly because I was trying to overlay a, a drawing, but you know, 15, 20 feet, maybe a little more. Is, are both wells still within 500 feet of this pit? They are. With respect to this particular application, what is the specific mechanism provided under the application to abate or eliminate dust? Well, I understand the applicant is going to have a, 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 some type of dust control, but I, I really don't know what they're going to do. Uh, there, is there any way to tell from the application how they intend to do that? Not that I can tell, no, sir. How about uh, with respect to noise? Is there anything in the application with respect to noise control that you can tell us about? Uh, there's nothing other than the, the time limit starts at 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and you know some of the additional buffering may slow it down at least on the south side. With respect to this particular pit, uh, do you have any computation or estimate of the amount of uh, soils to be excavated from a pit this size? Yes, again, I'm, I'm taking a, 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 what's called a PDF of a drawing, so they're pretty rough estimates, but it's, it's in the tens of millions of cubic feet, um, closer, to, closer to 40 or 50 million cubic feet. Do you have any notion of how far down this is going to go, this pit? From the drawings that I saw, it was between 50 and 60 feet deep, depending on where on the site it was. At what point in this area, if you know, will you reach groundwater? I don't know for sure, um, but, and, and again, we don't have the geotech, but 
I believe it would be well above the, the bottom depth of the pond. With respect to this application, uh, did you have any prior communication with the staff regarding its uh, inconsistency or not with residences in the area? I've had none. What particular inconsistencies with residential use do you note in connection with this application? Do you understand my question? I, I do, I do. Um, you know, this is gonna be very close to some residences and I believe that the, the, the exhibit four kind of shows where they are, but we are, we're starting a pretty major mining operation very close to quite a few residences. So there is gonna be, even if the dust were completely under control, it's gonna be noisy and, and they start early. With respect to this particular application, uh, how long does a pit like this operate in terms of years? There, there's no way for me to know how long. It'll, be to, it'll depend on how quickly um, they attack it. I mean, how much equipment they put, they put out there, how much, um, you know, it, dump truck, what demand is there for them. You know, I just ran some quick calculations, um, some rough estimates, and you're talking over 100,000 truckloads of material, depending on the dump truck size. So if, if you back that in, if a truck left there every 15 minutes while they're open for operation, they would run steady every 15 minutes, a truck leaving for six years. I don't think that's gonna, I think it's gonna be much longer than that if I were to guess, but that's the scale of this operation. With respect to this operation, what do you understand to be the plan or protocol for reclamation of the site once it is exhausted? I, I've seen a couple of, um, um, things in the report, something about a storm, possibly a stormwater pond, possibly a lake uh, with a house out there. I haven't seen any detail. Is there anybody living on that particular site at this time? Not that I know of. What, uh, what financial assurances are set out in the plan to your knowledge that those reclamations will be accomplished consistent with any legal requirements that may exist at the time? I haven't been provided any. With respect to this, uh, alleged buffer is there anything in the application that says there will not be noise no is there anything that says there will not be dust no is there any identification of exactly what the dust remediation pardon me the dust control mechanism will be there's nothing i saw okay Mr. Merrill, item seven, exhibit seven is your curriculum vitae. Is it true and correct? That's correct. Uh, thank you. I've, I, if you're done, I've I'm got sorry. a couple. I've got a couple of questions with Mr. Merrill. Um, I, I know I'm hammering this point, but I, I don't think I've gotten a, a clear answer yet. Maybe you can advise me. Um, so we have a, a lady who lives north of this area. She has a well that's 200 feet deep. Um, <clears throat> when you dig a big hole in one area, what does that do as far as what she can get out of her well as, as far as water? Well, I don't know, um, and, and you're not going to know um, until you do get all the geotechnical and the studies. Uh, what kind but of But in, in general, what happens to? Um, you know, again, in, in general, it's so I would I would hate to say without that technical data, you just don't know. Don't know. You, need, you need a specialist in that that can look at the soils, look at the different types. It, 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 you know, you dig in a big hole, could uh, pull groundwater to her. It could introduce pollutants. It's it's gonna it's gonna really depend on um, uh, what the makeup of that soil is, where the layers are, and you just right sitting right here, you don't know. Okay. 
Um, when you're doing this around um, environmentally sensitive areas, wetlands, um, are there measures that one would take to prevent encroachment or devastation of, of a wetland? Sure, I mean, I mean, there'll be provisions to prevent silts and erosion and, um, you know, this will go through the, the, the water management district. I have no doubt that Jerry will do a great job and, 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 and monitor that. There's quite a few permits that they would have to do. Okay. Ms. Merrill, I have a question. Do you have any idea where the aqua, aqua is uh, in this area? How deep it is before you hit it? Um, that's a prob probably a, a complex question that's beyond my ability. To answer, I, you know, there's different aquifers out there. Uh, some of it's surficial groundwater, and then there's deeper sand and gravel. It, it, it's, but you know, the wetlands are, are a good indication that it's it's not far from the surface where the wetlands are. Okay, Mr. Chairman, we've talked about formally designating Mr. Merrill an expert. I don't ever think we did it. We didn't. And you have in the past. We would, did last year. Uh, yes, if you would make that motion. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move that Ms. Merrill, for the purposes of this hearing, be uh, designated uh, as an engineering expert. In fact, it might be noted that he's been recognized by this county also as an expert. So we have a motion. Yes. We have a second. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Those in favor signify raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Any, any board, any other questions of this speaker? I got, I got one more question. How do you make this 44 acre hole a pond? Well, I mean, essentially it appears you dig a hole and um, the groundwater will fill up to where it's going to fill up. And, um, you know, it, I guess it becomes what's your definition of a pond? And that's what I don't know if this is a recreational lake or is it a stormwater pond? Um, you know, we don't know. But um, my belief is that it would fill up with water once they completed excavation. Naturally. Naturally. Okay. And when I say fill up, it would fill up to a certain level, not all the way to the top. Can I follow up on this question? Um, would you expect the water to seep into the, um, the pit as, as the digging goes on? I, I would. Again, I don't have a geotechnical report, but, but um, uh, odds are very high that it would. Then that water would have to be discharged somewhere? Um, that would be up to Mr. McGuire. It could be large enough that the, the storm water that comes into it, um, it would just fill up and draw down. Um, you know, the, a discharge on something this large, particularly when I don't know what's draining to it, it may be large enough to hold whatever stormwater comes to it. Uh, but I would have to uh, get with the engineer record and see what his his calculations show. Can I ask staff a, a quick question? Yes, sir. Uh, Drew, um, where? Let me start over again. If, if the pit were approved and, and excavation began and water started seeping in from the high water table and, and it would have to be pumped out in order to continue digging, um, that means it has to be discharged somewhere. Um, we don't know any of that is true at this point, but at some point in time, it may happen. Um, what do you do about discharging water if that were the case? Um, okay, uh, I hate to do this, but we have a whole lot of unknowns here without the geotag. Um, we don't know where the water table is, if there's an aqua clued under there, which would prevent. Um, 
Well, and we would also require um, the applicant's engineer would be submitting a stormwater management plan as part of the uh, development review. So if it happened in the future, then there is a process uh, to resolve that. Yes, sir. Kind of issue. Yes, sir. That that's something that we require with the uh, you DRC. You require it today because you don't know. Correct. What might happen, but if that were to happen, you can deal with it. The county can. Correct. We would have a plan on record for their stormwater. Okay. Mr. Merrill, I've got one last question. Listening to your testimony, in your professional opinion, then. If this project is approved, that uh, and this pit is excavated, then there is a possibility that surrounding privately owned water wells could be their water, those residents' water could be affected by this uh, excavation is that right uh, certainly there certainly there's a possibility I, I you know one of the reasons I believe that the code protects public wells from borrow pits is precisely for that reason so you know why protect a public and not a private well one thing is the, the a lot of the public wells are very well known where they are and you can you can locate them and you can prohibit them one of the reasons we have this process, I believe, is because it does bring out where the private wells and that may not be of record. When they're older, they're not necessarily on record with DEP or any other sources. So that's part of the process we're going through. So they're, so they're, so they're expressly prohibited for public wells, but private wells, maybe, maybe not, depending on the code. But I think that's why we have this process. Um, I don't understand why why a private well would be less vulnerable than a public well. It may be drawing less, maybe some of the thought, but obviously there's a, a, a possibility. We don't know that right now. Um, I know Mr. Connors has told us his well's um, uh, fairly shallow, and you're adding a 60-foot excavation uh, very close to it. Yeah. And if I, I guess a call area to that would be the closer a private well would be located to this uh, project, then potentially the more vulnerable it would be I to would disturb. Agree, I would agree with that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I have a few cross-examination questions, Mr. Absolutely, Chairman. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Mr. Merrill, um, as an engineer in Escambia County, you've gone through the development review process uh, before, correct? I have. Hundreds of times? Possib possibly. Um, and you recognize that we're here before this Board of Adjustments for a conditional use approval, correct? I do. And that's different than a site development review, correct? Correct. And di different from a permit process, correct? Correct. And you're familiar with both of those needing to be done if there's a reclamation for this um, this use, correct? I am. So today we're here and the board is being asked to consider the, addition, the criteria for conditional use, correct? That's correct. Would you agree with me that the um, planning director, uh, Mr. Horst Jones, is the one in, who makes interpretations of the land development code? I would, and I'm not going to disagree with you. I just don't. Know. I mean, you've been involved in things in which we would have disagreements with Mr. Jones, and we would typically lose, right? <laughs> we have, and I've also had him refer to attorneys, so I, yes. I, I'm not going to stay. Understood. Um, my point is, is that uh, some of the questions that the um, public and the board have addressed are issues that would be addressed in other forms. Is that correct? I.e., a development review and development approval. Correct. Yes, I mean, types, the, the, the type and thickness of the buffer may be an example. Right. So the, the definitions and or the, the specifics on performance standards would come in more detail with more reports and more submissions, correct? Correct. And there's a process in place that the Board of County Commissioners have put for us to have that assurance. Is that correct? Yes. There are performance standards that must be met. 
Uh, there are um, guidelines which are, must be uh, adhered to, and there are permits which must be had, all of which are in different forms than the one we're at now, correct? Correct. And in fact, in this case, the Board of County Commissioners will have to approve a reclamation plan for the proposed reclamation for Pond, correct? From what I understood from the board today. Mr. Yes, Jones is so stated. Did you hear, were you here when he I said? I was. Did you hear him say that? Um, I heard I, I heard somebody say it. Okay. <laughs> and as part of that process, the Board of County Commissioners, the ones that are in charge of making the rules for the county, will be the ones personally who will have to make that decision, correct? I believe that to be correct. And based on your experience as an engineer and through your um, years of going through this process, um, do you believe that they simply rubber stamp the things that either this board does or that Mr. Jones does, or do you think that they give due consideration for the protection of the public and its adverse impacts, if any, on the public? I do not believe they rubber stamp approval. And with regards to um, an earlier indication that, um, or in referring to the exhibit that you prepared, exhibit four, is that the one you prepared? That's correct. And what was the purpose of listing out the residents in the area? It was, it was to show how close other homes are. Uh, you know, one of the, the, I guess the main t issue it was denied last time, from what I recall, was really had nothing to do with the technical. It was that um, it was incompatible because there were so many residents in the area. Right, because a lot of people came in and were opposed to it, and it was it disapproved. Is that correct? I wouldn't say it's because a lot of people came in is why they disapproved it. I, I, they found it incompatible with the surrounding area. But you're familiar with the fact that if we were greater than a thousand feet from all residents, we wouldn't even be here, right? This I would am. be approved because this is ag and this is a permitted use in ag, correct? I am. And so it's only because there are residents within a thousand feet that we're here, correct? I believe that's correct. And so the fact that there are residences was never, I mean, everybody knew that. That's why we're here. I mean, for instance, uh, that was the question, right? We're here because this permitted use is within a thousand feet of some residents, correct? So if it can't be compatible within a thousand feet, we would, the county commissioners would have just prohibited it, correct? I would like to think so. Right. So we hope that. If we follow the rules, and we do hope that people follow the rules, that the county commissioners know that those rules have an effect, and that effect will be to ensure compatibility. Would you agree? Not necessarily. Um, you know, as I stated before, with the, with one of the, 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 the part of the process of these public meetings is to bring out the specifics of a case. Such New as information this. with regards to, for instance, as you said, where the residents are and the location and impact. Every piece of property is different and that's why we're here. I mean, had, right. if you had a resident 800 feet away uphill, I, you know, maybe it wouldn't matter. And each project has a staff review and a staff recommendation, correct? Yes. And you were here when staff made their um, overview and showed that each of the criteria for the conditional uses have been met and that staff recommended approval, their expert opinion? I was here this morning, yes. I have no further questions. Thank you, sir. Board members, any questions? You have, sir. You have questions, Cross? I'm just going to clarify with my own witness. Is there anything in the Land Development Code that restricts this board's consideration to residents within a thousand feet once the issue of its consistency with local use comes to it. In other words, if we're here because there are residences within a thousand feet, is there anything in the land development code that says this board can only consider those residences within a thousand feet? Not that I know of. In fact, that this board is to determine whether or not this use is compatible with surrounding uses and it's not limited to uses within a thousand feet that's correct board members any questions for the speaker before uh closing statement I'm oh sorry, yes Donna. that's okay mr smith i need to establish for the record that my client mr connors has a well on that almost on that line 
that he uses for water and irrigation and drinking water for his residence. I need that for the record. Yes, sir. And if you don't mind, I would like to make sure this record is clear because I'm not sure this is where we end. I don't mean that. This puts it on record, your statement. I believe you were close enough to the mic that it was heard. Well, I will represent to the board, hopefully as an evidentiary fact. And I don't mind him calling his landowner to ask this question. I have no objection to that. Mr. Bates, do you want, you submitted some photos? Yes, I want. May I include you? I want, I would like the exhibits I've submitted to be accepted. I can lay a predicate for each if you need, if need be. Let's, let's do that. Yes, he submitted those to us prior to the meeting. I'm sorry, when were they submitted? They were submitted as we were instructed by email yesterday. Yesterday afternoon. And we can pull them up for everyone. I just, I just would like to make sure they're on the record before this group. If, and I will move their admission if that's how this needs to work. I just have some specific questions I want to ask you. I'm not, I'm not sure what we're trying to accept into evidence here. Has it been presented to staff? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, here we go. Mr. Chairman, I thought we were going to get testimony about the nearness of the water well and when we started discussing photos. He has a photograph in there that was, came through the last hearing, which I believe shows the pump house for the well in relation to his property line. I thought that might help clarify. Oh, okay. Exhibit three. That is exhibit three. All right. Well, let me ask specific questions. First, Mr. Connors, you were sworn earlier. Yes. Are you the owner or the principal of the owner of the property immediately to the south? Yes, sir. Is that a picture of your house and yard? Yes, sir. And the fence that's on the right-hand side, is that the border with the subject? It's about 12 inches off the property line. And the house that's there, what is that? That is the housing for my water well. Do you, what do you use the water well for? Drinking water. Step up to the mic. Sorry. Drinking water, a little bit of irrigation. I've got horses on the property, chickens, guineas, all kinds of wildlife that would provide water for them. Who resides on that property with you? My family. That's your wife and children? And I've got a, I've got an eight-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy drinking out of that well. Is the well located behind the little tree there? There's a, yes, sir. A camellia. Right behind that tree, that bush. Okay. Thank you. You'll see, you'll see a wooden structure right behind the bush adjacent to the fence. Was the well there before this application for a permit or for a borrow pit a year ago? Yes, sir. Did you dig it? No, sir. Who was there when you bought the property? Yes, sir. How deep is it? It's approximately 80 to 90 feet deep. And that, the residence is built in the fifties. The testimony earlier from Mr. Morero was that that well is within 500 feet of this particular site. Is that your recollection? It's the, the well is about four feet from the fence, five feet from the property line, which would put it about 30 feet from the proposed pit last go around and add another 25 feet to that. Now it'd be 55 feet from the recently proposed pit. So we'd be talking 55 feet. Thank you. I have a few cross examination questions for Mr. Connors. Back to the mic, Mr. Connor. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Connors, when did you purchase and move into this property? It was May of 2020. And what water management district permit do you have for consumptive use out of that well for drinking water? What permit? Correct. 
uh, it would probably have uh, been with the house when I purchased it. And what um, water testing, if any, did you do uh, after your purchase in 20, uh, May 2020 for that drinking water well? It uh, hasn't been tested recently. Where is the nearest location to uh, drinking water supply in your, uh, in relationship to your property boundary? Um, probably uh, 900 feet up to the edge of uh, 95A. And who, if any, if you know, services the potable water in that area? That's a Molina water. And do you know where the Molina water wells are? Um, yes, sir. I've been by them. Good. And are, are they greater than 500 feet from this um, for the project? that's proposed. You're talking about uh, their actual- Correct, water. the Molino water, public water wells. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what, if any, uh, conversations uh, have you had with neighbors with regards to this project for this particular uh, iteration, not, <laughs> not the one that you opposed in the past? Um, I've talked to several people, um, basically, um, Nothing much has changed from the the prior plan. Um, now the question was how many how many people and when did you talk to them about this particular project? Oh, probably uh, half a dozen to a dozen directly. And what if any mailers did you send out with regards to this project? Uh, I sent mailers out to uh, the surrounding properties on several occasions. And were those mailers in opposition or in in support of this opposition. project? Opposition. I have no further question. Thank you, Board. Any questions of the speaker? Again, I just want to make sure that our exhibits are part of the record. Uh, I, I will ask the Board to uh, make that motion at this point. Thank you. Uh, you uh, board, we need to uh, approve these items into the into the record. Do we have a motion? I Thank you. Any hmm? I haven't seen any exhibits. This. So mm -hmm. there's 21 pages. Oh. So once Can we get a, an idea of what it is we're wanting to approve? A description. Certainly, these these exhibits. Uh, the first one is, is a plat depiction of the area that shows the Patterson Pit. That's Exhibit 1. You already have other depictions of it. Exhibit 2 is one used last time that shows the, the situs or the location of the various residences immediately proximate to the pit or the proposed pit. Exhibit 3 is the picture that shows the proximity of Mr. Connor's well to the uh, border or the boundary line for the property where the pit will be. Uh, exhibit four is the depiction that was done by Mr. Merrill. Exhibit five uh, is the findings of fact by the, the uh, staff from last year, which is a portion of what I was examining uh, the staff about today. Uh, item six is irrelevant. It's just the resolution that adopted how this particular body is supposed to act as a quasi-judicial group. Uh, item seven is the curriculum vitae for Mr. Merrill, who has already been approved as a uh, expert. And item eight is a photocopy of the relevant page with respect to wells because I was going to refer to it in my closing so that all of you would be equally aware of the particular provisions that are at issue. And so those are all of the exhibits and I don't think any of them are particularly remarkable. I just wanted to make sure it was part of this record. Chair, Chair seeks a motion to accept these exhibits into the record. And Mr. Smith, I would simply uh, register an objection to um, Exhibit 5, it being the staff report for another iteration of this that's not relevant here, 
and to uh, Exhibit 6, as Mr. Bates says, it's irrelevant. Well, I don't mind about Exhibit 6. Exhibit 5 is this is the prior inconsistent statement of this staff with respect to a borrow pit at this location. And I think in evaluating the staff's report this time, what they had previously said is important. And covered in cross-examination. So we have a uh, seeking to eliminate Exhibit 5 and 6. So first of all, I think we need to recognize the, uh, the exhibits presented. I make a motion that we accept the exhibits except for 5 and 6. I'll second that. So we have a second. We have a first. We have a second. Motion by Judy. Second by Randy. <coughs> Those in favor. And we are we are accepting the exhibits except five and six. And uh, those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Mr. Chairman, before we go to vote, I don't. Uh, I'm concerned about. Uh, I think it's five. I understand what uh, why it's being offered. It is an inconsistent uh, inconsistency from the staff's position from the last uh, uh, at the last hearing, and I for and from the testimony we've heard from both uh, sides, uh, both attorneys, I think it is material. Uh, should this go further, uh, I believe that that would be an important part of the record if it were going up to uh, be heard in the court system. Okay, how about six? Six is, I agree that six is not really relevant in where we're going. So you want to amend your motion to accept? Uh, I do not want to amend my motion. You want it to like it? I do. Like it reads, okay. So the motion is to accept uh, all the <laughs> items presented in the exhibit except five and six. We have a motion. We have a second. Any discussion? Those I would probably just have to agree um, that I believe Exhibit 5 um, is useful in determining um, all aspects of this case um, in the manner in which things have changed since a year ago or have not changed. In, in the grand scheme of things a year ago. So I, I do think it's um, it's necessary. The um, Exhibit 5 is only there to show the staff's recommendation is different and the recommendation is different on a different set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this case doesn't have anything to do. The one a year ago doesn't have anything to do with the one today as far as I'm concerned and the the facts presented to staff are different mm -hmm. so the result was different mr. chairman bef before we vote I want to vote to support the bulk of these uh, exhibits uh, I wonder could we amend the motion to allow us to vote on one through four and then dispose of uh, five and six. Yeah. That way uh, we would have those in the record for sure and <laughs> fate will take care of the others. Seven and eight as well, please. Uh, one through four and seven and eight. 
Could, could I just, as a matter of expediting, suggest that maybe a separate vote on Exhibit 5 would be in order? Well, that's, that's the only one that's an issue. That's sort of where I'm trying to get to. I know, I was just trying to <laughs> help. I will remind the chair there's a motion and a second on the floor. You're in discussion now. Uh, would you uh, be uh, amenable to amending everything except and have a separate vote on five? Uh, I think that's kind of what I've done in theory because we're eliminating five and six and then we can definitely vote on that. Next, our next vote could be to accept five. I thought we were voting on uh, accepting everything except five and six. Which is the same way of saying let's accept one through four yeah, plus six and seven. Bring it right. Okay, fine. I'm, I'm just trying to get there. I'm a I'm an old man. Y'all are going to have to, you know, make allowance. So it's the, the motion is to accept all the exhibits except five and six. It, it, it's under discussion. We have a motion. We have a second. Any other discussion? Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we uh, drop uh, Exhibit 6 and add Exhibit 5 uh, or approve Exhibit 5 uh, to the uh, to the record. I second. We have a motion. We have a second to uh, eliminate Exhibit 5 no, uh, oh. uh, six. Six, exhibit six, yes. And uh, add uh, five recommended. to the record. And add five to the recommended. We have a motion, we have a second. I just want to say that I think it's um, redundant to have uh, prior case information in this case's exhibits. Any other discussion? Those in favor of the motion signify by raising your right hand. One, two, three, four. Four passes. Abby, What's, can I clarify the four members that? Pardon? Were you included in that? I didn't hear her. Did she? Hmm? She's got it? Uh, staff have a closing statement. I, I do believe the applicant um, has a case or some cross he'd like to get to. Uh, we can hold off and see where that goes. Would you like to make a closing statement? If, if we're Chairman Smith, if it were um, appropriate at this time, I would like to have the opportunity um, for that rebuttal that we talked about in summary. Yes, we're, yeah. you're next. Thank you. Okay, you, you're, you're okay? I was going to suggest that closings ought to be at the end. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, well done away for the applicant. Um, at this time, I'd like to call Mr. Jerry McGuire, and um, I'd like to have Mr. Uh, McGuire explain to you his um, qualifications as a professional engineer. And then after that, um, he explaining that to you, I'd like to tender him as an expert in that area and then ask him some questions. Thank you. 
And before we get started, staff will definitely contest that Mr. Jerry Maguire is an expert. We have, just like we have worked with Mr. Shaw on, on many occasions, we worked with Mr. Jerry, and he, so we know he's a licensed engineer, so we, staff Chairman, concur. Most if you have no objection, then the chair will seek a motion to recognize him as an expert. Mr. Chairman, I'll move that Mr. McGuire be uh, certified as an expert in the area of engineering, Mr. McGuire? Engineering? Yes. In the area of engineering. Okay. Second. We have a motion. We have a second to accept you as an, an expert. Those in favor signify raise your right hand. Passes unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, if it pleases the board, I, I'll just ask the questions um, from here. But we do want to get Mr. McGuire sworn. Can you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I will. Thank you. Mr. McGuire, um, will you explain to the uh, Board of Adjustments and the public uh, your uh, involvement in this uh, matter and your work on the site plan? as it regarded the application for this project? Uh, yes, sir. I was engaged about uh, roughly, not quite two years ago, uh, by the owner. Uh, he was working on another pit. He wanted to do his own pit, and he picked out a piece of property. This happens to be the piece of property that he picked. And he came to me, and we worked together on developing a plan, proposed plan for the pit. Uh, got some information that we could without spending a lot of money. Uh, You'll see some things up there on some wetland lines. Those were approximate what the staff used. What we had done was uh, Wetland Sciences did an actual wetland line, uh, surveyed it in and all. So we have that. Same way with the soils data, uh, we compared it uh, to existing soils in the area. We went and looked at the site. There is an existing pond on the site, on the top of the hill. It's about six to eight foot deep, it holds water. Uh, dug down a little bit in a couple of spots just to see you're about three feet down to you hit water and that's confirmed by the uh, NCRS soils tables so the chances are of us having to dry pond are probably slim to none uh, we will have geotechnical work done we can have piezometric readings done also if we need to do that but at this point we don't see that so once we picked out the property and the wetlands located, we decided, you know, where do we have to go from here to get code compliance? So what we did was a pre-application submittal, which is standard on any project in Scambia County. Uh, submitted some plans, just some, you know, uh, preliminary construction plans, uh, just to see what kind of comments we got, because the uh, conditional use can come up quite often. Uh, we do those on a lot of projects. Uh, they don't reach this level, let me say that. And... Uh, so when we submitted, you know, it came back from the planning folks, uh, which are very good people, that we needed to do a conditional use because we were within 1,000 feet of a residence. And we also had several other reviewers that gave us comments on the stormwater and some other things. Uh, four or five reviewers just signed off, said everything's fine with us, and that was fine too. And that's typical in projects also because, you know, it may be on a flood zone, it may be on uh, ECUA, you're not in their water system, they're gonna sign off immediately anyhow. So once we got that information, we took it, uh, we developed a plan um, for a proposed pond. Now, you had asked a question about littoral shelves earlier today. Is that correct? That's why I should have addressed it to you. Uh, those are uh, required on some ponds in the state of Florida. They're not always required. And that's under section 8.03E of the Water Management District Guidelines. The Toro Shelf serves a very important purpose in a highly urbanized area where you've got a lot of lots, where you've got a lot of commercial, and they do take the nutrients and pollutant loadings down, the oil and greases off the streets. They do all that. But you get away from the city, and you don't have a lot of lots. You don't have a lot of commercial. You're not just dumping uh, fertilizers, pesticides on the lawn. It kind of goes away. So under Section 8.03E, you can do a regular pond. Now what you have to do to compensate is you put in 50% additional storage of water. And we've done that. Okay. I'll talk your way. But, but anyhow, so we added the 50% additional storage volume, which means it takes more water for it to come out of the pond or exit the pond, okay? 
So that, that's what we're doing. The toilet shelf, yes, they do serve important purposes and conditions. And at the same time, you don't really have to have them everywhere. And that's why the law, Water Management District, Florida Statute 62330, allows different scenarios like that. Okay? And uh, staff didn't have a problem with that. I mean, they understand the law. I mean, the girl, that, the lady that does the uh, engineering review, it's a PE, very good. I've been doing this 41 years. And I've done these kind of ponds several places, the Moore's Golf Course, other places. Uh, so they're not always the tall shelves uh, on ponds. Uh, just to clarify that, I didn't know if everybody understood that, but I agree with Mr. Day. They do serve a very good purpose in the locations that are needed, okay? Um, so we went through the review, got a few comments back, the main thing being the conditional use. And, uh, you know, when we got to that point, we did an application last year. Uh, we presented that, came up to the board, a lot of questions and all. Now we did check on some uh, Molino water usage records to see who all had meters, even though they may have wells in their yard, uh, just to see. And quite a few of the residents do have uh, their own Molino water, even though they use a well, but they're also on Molino water. Okay, I think they may have a list of that. I'm not quite sure. Um, but as far as the, the this project itself, you know, when you get to reclamation plans and things like that, you're on down the road from this process here, which is just strictly the uh, conditional use process. Uh, we have to do, you know, like to say, geotechnical studies. Even though we have good data and a 41 years of experience doing these, I can go out there and tell you, you're going to have water in that pond, and it's going to be pretty high. Okay? It'll end up being about a 135 elevation, so it's pretty high in that pond with a 145 top and discharge. Okay? Um, it is a retention system. There was a point made about retention systems. You got retention systems, you got detention systems. You got wet retention with wet detention, and that's what this is. Okay, when you retain water, you hold it. When you detain water, you release it. So, in this case, the permanent pool, the lake, whatever you want to call it, it's a lake, it's a pond, I don't care what you call it, it's the same thing, same principle, everything at work. It stays to that level. Now it will fluctuate in dry seasons. It goes up and down, up and down. Then the water on top of that is a, uh, it's a detention volume. So it's a wet detention on top. And you detain uh, based on certain criteria that the state establishes. It's in 62, 330. You can't change it. Uh, simple, simple, simple calculation. They, that takes about that much calculation. And it's a spreadsheet you put it in. Okay, in the very bottom of it, from over a year, you know, no planning is required because we have 100%, 50% capacity. So there never was a need to do a littoral shelf on this project. You know, I can go back and do one, yes. It doesn't serve a purpose on this project, okay? Number two, you've got to understand, too, that you're talking about a reclamation plan in a pond after all the dirt's gone. Let's say that takes 10 or 12 years. That pond's not going to be a pond until that point in time. And there's a lot of work they have to do to get to that point. There's a lot of work they have to do at the end to make it a viable pond so that, you know, sides don't crumble down, slough off and all. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. But, it, but before it becomes a retention pond, wet pond, uh, whatever, uh, you're talking years from now. And Mr. McGuire, with regards to the site plan, <coughs> with regards to the site plan there for this um, uh, project, uh, what is the increase in buffers from uh, on this one on the south? Yeah, what we did on the south end, since there was a lot of concern and questions, we went to a 50-foot buffer from a 25. And it's a 50-foot buffer. A buffer means a lot of things, but what it is, it's it's preserving the natural vegetation and adding additional vegetation or screening and also a fence to it. So there's a lot of things that go on with buffering in the county. And having reviewed the staff report, um, did you note that there were all of the criteria for the customary use uh, uh, had been met? Yeah, which was like the other attorney made, that's different from last year. But uh, there was- Conditional use. Yeah, conditional use from last year, <laughs> correct. Mr. McGuire, with, uh, on your site plan, again, 
Um, can you explain to the board the uh, additional permits and processes which would have to go, uh, the applicant would have to go through before they would be able to actually begin um, using this area as a borrow pit if the conditional use were approved? Right. Yeah, there are other agencies that have permitting authority on this. Um, one of them is the Water Management District. Uh, they do environmental resource permitting permits. We'd get one, what's called an individual permit. They would look at wetlands and they would look at uplands. They would look at mining operations, uh, reclamation plans, a lot of things, very stringent on all those. And uh, a lot of geotechnical data calculations in order to do that. Um, as far as a wetland permit on this through the ERP, we're not touching the wetland. Your impacts with an ERP permit are based on how much up and how much wetland you're touching. We're saying exclude all those and put buffers in. Okay, you have a secondary impact, but you don't have a primary, so you don't really have a wetland ERP permit. You have a wetland mining and uh, stormwater permit, basically. Um, as far as the DEP, which could say, well, they may need a 404, which is kind of a new permit under uh, guidelines. Again, we're not impacting wetlands. We have buffers between us and the wetlands. There would be no need for a Section 404 permit from the state of Florida. Um, we don't need water and sewer permits. They're going to use uh, porta potties on site, um, and then all, and they can have the igloo jugs. So that's the way they handle that. So you're out of water and sewer, more likely out of a Section 404. They're core wetlands. Again, not impacting them. The joint application for the earth will be sent to everybody. I guarantee it will happen. It always happens. We don't have jurisdiction. You know, we've looked at it. We agree. Thank you very much. And Mr. McGuire, there was a question that came uh, from one of the board members earlier about discharging. If there were water that seeped into it, and where would that water be discharged? There won't be any water discharged from this pit, will it? Uh, yes. Yes, it will. Now, let me say that. Uh, there's a water level that will be maintained. That's called a permanent pool. That's your water table. That's what's, well, it's what's called a phreatic surface. It's not your standing gravel aquifer 700 feet down. It's not other shallow wells 200 feet. It's the actual water surface for that ground in that area. And you'd be surprised at how constant it is from area to area, especially out in the country like that. So that's the phreatic surface. That would be the permanent pool. That would be the lake. That's the top of the lake. You want to go ski on it? And ski on top of that surface. What'll happen when water comes in from rainfall or wash or whatever, or additional ground seepage comes in, it has a little tube about that big in the structure, and that discharges at, through that hole. Small hole, doesn't take much. I did calculations on it, it's three inch hole in a structure. So that bleeds down the uh, water that's gone above the lake surface because you brought in a bunch of storm water. It's going to bleed back down to the lake surface. That's all that's going on there. Uh, it's a straight calculation. Um, and also that there is water that comes in and goes out. Mostly the water here is coming in as rainfall. Okay. And it's going to rain on the top of the lake. It's going to be some of the slopes on the side banks that will run right down into the lake. But to say we have any input of big pipes coming off the streets and roadways. No, none of that. And Mr. McGuire, where does the rainfall discharge to today? It goes back down the head. If you look at the, oh boy, for a second. I've got the mic now. Now, the actual contouring flows from the highway down to the wetlands, and that's a natural contour. It's gonna to continue to go there, okay? It's not gonna stop. What we'll do is put in a structure up there, it should be a concrete box or an overflow weir, one of the two, uh, into the pond, right there, okay? And that'll be set at an elevation that allows water to discharge, okay? And it'll be highly um, fortified on the way out so you don't create a problem in the wetlands. But the water that was going to the, to the wetlands to start with will still go to the wetlands, okay? Even the discharge, treated water. No further questions. Okay, we're going to go ahead. Uh, no, no, any, any questions? Mm. 
What is the specific dust suppression device that is contemplated? Yeah, on most pits, I understand this too, we don't talk dust suppression. If it's a wet pit, they're going to be dredging material out of water to get it out of the ground. Okay? So if you're dredging, it comes up wet. It's not going to go blowing around. Now, Huh? I do. I hear myself. Let's talk into the mic, Mr. McCoy. I'm trying to quit. Okay. Uh, so anyhow, most of the water that's going to be coming out after a certain point is going to be dredged out with a dredge machine. It's not like a backhoe throwing dirt in the ground, boom, boom, boom. It's not like that at all. And what can happen on piles of dirt, yes, they can uh, dry out, especially in the hot sun. Uh, and, and the easiest thing to do with that is to put spray them down with water. Have a water truck uh, with a hose to it and spray them down and keep them sprayed down. Monitor that. They can get a little instrument that uh, you can take dust readings. The county does that when they come out. Do the same thing for yourself. Help yourself out sometimes, okay? Uh, especially when you got windy conditions. That's when dust tends to move around, okay? So there's a lot of things they can do uh, and will, will be done. There's also, chemical, there's also chemical agents you can put on material uh, to make it bind together. It's a binding agent. Uh, you can just put that on. If you've got extended time frames on a spoil cell, maybe as big as this whole room, spray it down. And what it does, it binds the outside. So it doesn't have a big effect with wind blowing and moving dirt around. Okay? So there is... <coughs> There is no specific plan outlined in the application for dust control. Speak into the mic, Mr. McGuire. It's not the point in time. That will be done as part of the process. Yes, sir. Um, you said 11 to 12 years for the excavation of this site? Uh, it could be. I'm like uh, William. Who knows how fast the material's going to be sold? You heard the testimony about how many truckloads conceivably we were talking about. Yeah, they did estimates. I can tell you the exact numbers. Well, do you have a computation? <laughs> uh, the numbers uh, from the previous, I'll have to rerun the ones for this. But uh, well, So you don't. I'm just asking you, do, you, do you have any reason to disagree with the numbers that you've heard? Uh, yeah, I think a little bit high, but that's okay. Well, what, what happens when you move dirt? You take dirt out of the ground, it's in place dirt. When you throw it on the ground, it's no longer in place. It's actually a bigger pile. What you put in a truck is a bigger pile. Okay? So it may be 16 yards in the ground, but it may be 14 going in that truck. So there might have been more truckloads as opposed <laughs> to what was estimated. A ah, possibility. Yeah. May have been less, too, now if it's wet. Okay? Um, where do you live? Base. Yeah. Into the mic, Mr. McGuire. Into the and Base, Florida. How close to a borrow pit? Uh, I am about 11 houses down from a borrow pit. Is it active? Uh, yes, sir, it is. 11 houses down, how many? How much distance is that? Well, I'm going to make a lot and everybody else does. It's probably 1,200, 1,300 feet. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Board members, any, any questions? I, uh, Mr. McGuire, I have a question. If I understand the, the collective evidence that's been presented so far, the testimony, uh, and help me on this, the only real difference between the prior application a year ago and this present application is, is that uh, you have moved, uh, increased the buffer, and also uh, decreased a small amount of <coughs> acreage or area uh, that you're going to uh, uh, use for the mining. Is that right? That's correct. When we moved the buffer in, it moved the pond wall in. So all that went in, too. It also um, created some issues with some grading, tying grades back into natural contour. No matter what you do, you got to try these existing grades. If you dig a hole, you build a mountain, you still got to tie the grades in. And you try to do those at a three to one or more slope, and 
uh, existing contours don't run like straight lines on a paper. If you look at my drawing, there's a lot of straight line work on there to get to a bottom of a hole and it creeps back up to a top. And if you look down here or up there, you'll see they're kind of triangular. They start disappearing. Well, they're tying back into the natural grade is what they're doing. Okay. Uh, and also, do you have any opinion, uh, if I recall Mr. Merrill's testimony, that the closer a private water well will be to this project, this excavation, mm -hmm. the more potentially problematic it might be for the water supply, the private well water supply. Yeah, what he's, what he's talking about is if, if you take the surface of ground, like this is on a steep slope going down, water surface just not sitting down here. Water surface is coming down the slope with that water sitting on top of it. Okay, that's why it makes a lake when you get through. Um, and at the same time, that lake will draw some water into it from the surrounding, okay? A well, when you put it in the ground, it has a cone of influence. The well points way down here. If you look at it, the shape comes up and this water is being pulled down. So it dries up in that area, but you still got the regular water, you know, 40, 50, 70, 80, 100 feet away, depending on the application, okay? So to sit there and say, it, yeah, it, it will definitely, no, nah, you can't say that. I can get some geotech and I can give you a real good idea but, uh, but no, you can't say one way or the other. I agree with what William said. It's hard to say that. Would it impact it five feet down? Will it bring it up one foot? I don't know. Yeah. Get some piezometric readings, you might we can tell, okay? And uh, would you have any quarrel with his, the exhibit he prepared that uh, is now in the record of the number of homes that private residences that surround this potential uh, yeah, you, uh, project? No, I wouldn't. I mean, William's very thorough in his work. I've known him for years, okay? And I don't, I don't have a problem with that exhibit, no, sir. So you would acknowledge this is not uh, a in the country in the sense that it's rural, uh, completely rural, agricultural uh, type of setting that it... Man, it's, it's fairly agriculture, yes sir, it is. You got uh, one acre lots and bigger, why not? But that it, there is a growing neighborhood that surrounds it. Uh, growth is going to the north in the Scambia County, yes sir, very much so. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. McGuire. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. That's it. Through. Mr. Chairman, I would um, like to call Mr. Patterson. Please, Mr. Patterson, will you please state your name and are you the owner and uh, the property that is the subject of this hearing? Yes, I'm Justin Patterson. Justin, get to the mic. I'm Justin Patterson, the owner of the property. And will please be sworn. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so be God? Amen. Thank you. Now, Mr. Patterson, just like I had to tell Mr. McGuire six times, you must... <laughs> speak into that mic lean over into it so that we can hear because the court reporter needs to hear you as does the um, members of the board mr patterson as the um owner of this property and the um person who has put forth this conditional use there has been some questions about whether the use uh, that is your claimed reclamation is actually a real reclamation or some fictitious uh, figment of our imagination. Can you state for the board what you plan to do with this project as a reclamation and why? Yes. The whole the whole point of this this permitting this permitting process is to where when I go to dig this lake that I want to dig, I can shape it 
you know, I'm not necessarily, just because that amount of property is permitted in, the 44 acres, I'm with y'all, it don't make sense. The top square where I have a big barn built right now is where I'm putting a house. I've already got the plans drawn up on it. I've got everything ready for it. I've been waiting on lumber prices to go down, to be honest. Um, that is going to be my forever home. Um, I want to dig the, the lake to where I can look at it off my front porch. But the whole, the whole point of it all is what we've been arguing about all day today, people have been pointing out, is the fact that half the things that have been said doesn't make any sense because the all the stuff that, that y'all are kind of consider, they're trying to get y'all to consider right now, is stuff that I have to, I have regulations on, people are going to make me do like the water, making sure the dust isn't bad, making sure all this stuff is done. I'm going to be forced to do that or I'll have consequences to pay. But I need, I can't get to that point without being approved here first. And Mr. Patterson, um, you indicated the reclamation plan is for a lake and for your um, own, you said forever, forever home, your residence. Yes, um, what experience do you have in the area of borrow pit operation and ensuring that those pits are operated in compliance with regulations in Escambia County? I have another pit in Cantonment. Um, I actually, in fact, I just had an inspection uh, on it last week. They come out, everything was good to go. I was inside my boundaries. Everything, you know, is good. I keep up, try to keep up the dust as best I can over there. It's going to, it's a lot, it's more difficult there because I have a lot longer road. But I know what I'm doing. I'm good at it. Um, I work with the neighbors that's around me over there at my other pit. And I've, I've tried to work with neighbors around my property up there. And Mr. Patterson, that um, inspection that you indicated just last week came from the county. Was that an inspection that you had prior notice of or that you had asked for? No, sir. I was notified um, that morning. Was it that morning or was it the morning that before? Afternoon before. The afternoon before, about, uh, yeah, it was about 4 o'clock um, the afternoon before they showed up. They and showed so up are morning. these part of routine inspections that the county does as part of its increased um, in oversight of these types of pits that Mr. Jones earlier talked about? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure that that one was, though. And uh, the results of that was you were fully in compliance, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Patterson, uh, why, if you want to have a residence with a lake, why don't you just dig a lake? Why do you have to have a borrow pit? That, that's what I'm planning on doing is building a lake. All right, but you've applied to put in a borrow pit on a 44-plus acre parcel. Do you understand that? Yes, sir, I do understand that, and I have a reason for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Board, any questions? That's all. Thank you, sir. I think uh, we will go with closing statements and uh, go go to a vote. Beginning with staff, would staff like to make any closing statement that you haven't already covered? <coughs> Covered things pretty deeply, I think. Um, <clears throat> just our findings stand as they are. Uh, nothing said today has changed uh, the staff's findings on that. Uh, still recommending approval with those enhanced buffering standards. And you, sir, would you like to make any uh, closing remarks? Mr. Dunaway and I just conferred. He'll go first, and I'll follow him. Okay, that's fair enough.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Board, and, um, and thank you to the members of the public who are here. Um, it's, it, it is a long hearing, but these things are important because you are the volunteers um, who are the keeper of these uh, requests, conditional uses, variances, uh, certain appeals. This is a conditional use, as we indicated when we, we uh, initially started. The conditional use process is for a permitted use in an agricultural zoning area. And I, I think that is just important uh, for us to continue to remember as the code uh, is set up. Many, many times, and in fact, um, earlier when we were waiting, as you were contemplating the earlier project that came before us, um, you know, there were people that were had some comments about, we just don't need another Dollar General. And again, how many Dollar Generals that we have in the county is really just not part of the code, right? You may have a, a, a personal opinion about whether that is the truth or not, but in your role as members of the Board of Adjustments, the number of Dollar Generals or how close they are to each other is really not a consideration for you. And you do a great job of, do, of knowing that and, and making that um, decision based on the evidence that is submitted here at the hearing um, before you. So that's what I'm asking you to do again today, what you have done many, many times over, both when I'm standing before you and when I'm not standing before you and you are here uh, with staff. And then also to remind you that your staff is your experts in the land development code. And you have heard from the three experts on your staff, and when I say your staff, the county staff, uh, Mr. Jones, the planning director who is charged with the interpretation of the land development code. Uh, Mr. Homer, who is the planner who presented this case uh, for you. And then Mr. Day, who is your uh, natural resource manager, all of whom, as you can imagine, have spent a lot of time behind the scenes preparing for this hearing, uh, preparing for this matter, working through their findings of fact, making difficult decisions in consultation uh, with, with the experts that they rely on, and they have presented to you here today in the hearing uh, the absolute indication to you that the applicant standing before you requesting uh, a conditional use for a borrow pit has met all of the criteria, has met all of the criteria. Therefore, your decision is to determine whether any of the confident and substantial evidence that you've heard here today would make this an adverse impact on the public. Is your approval of this conditional use so horrendous that the public will be adversely impacted? Not individually inconvenienced, but is the public as a whole going to be adversely impacted by this permitted use in agriculture? Now, it is no denying, and Mr. McGuire said it very clearly, Growth is coming to the north end of the county. I do not have to tell you as members of this board that that is the, tr that is the case. Agricultural land in this county, north of Barano Road, is being taken over by housing at a rapid rate. And that, those houses, they require dirt and they require, a, uh, they're taking up a lot of land. In this case, in this case, you have heard from the applicant who has indicated to you that he is trying to develop his forever house on a, on a uh, lake or pond. Now, he's in the dirt business. How do you create a lake on a sizable piece of agricultural land that you have? You dig a hole. Again, he's in the dirt business. What do you do with that dirt? Well, you can sell it. That's called a burrow pit. That is the that is the process that will occur after the proper permitting, after the, require, after the Board of County Commissioners approves a reclamation 
And after the uh, process of putting, uh, of, of extracting those minerals. What you do in agriculture is you, that agricultural land is for this kind of use. That is why it's a, it is a permitted use. It's agricultural land. Yes, there are people who are living there. Mr. Patterson is going to be one of those who wants to live there. He's going to live there with one single unit on a large piece of agricultural land, which will have a lake. Are there, are there the adverse impacts that you're having to consider? Are they adverse to the public? Is there an adverse impact to the public from this um, use? I submit to you, no, there is no competent substantial evidence that indicates that. We have heard that people will be inconvenienced. We have heard that people do not want a burrow pit next to them. But we have also heard from those same individuals that they have, there are houses out there on ponds, slant lakes. It is an area of the wetlands, which you have heard from the expert, Mr. McGuire, tell you the, will not be impacted by this project because of the buffering. There is going to be no impact to wetlands. And yet, you know, because you sit on this board that you hear over and over impact to wetlands from development, which is occurring in this county and the loss of that through permitting. That's not occurring here. No, no impact to wetlands. You have heard indication about um, dust and, no and noise, but you've also heard the evidence that the, the processes and the procedures in place to uh, ensure mitigation from that. And you have heard exact an example of the county on an existing permitted pit actually operated by the applicant property owner in this case in which they make these inspections periodically in which they are checking to make sure if dust and noise and you're operating in accordance with your permit and in your requirements. The county is doing that. They are following up on it. This is not, and I know I, just for me to even say it, it causes problems, but this is not rolling hills. We are not talking about a uh, construction and demolition debris disposal facility with problems that are going to be in increasing in issues. That's not what we are talking about here. We are talking about a conditional use approval for a permitted activity in an agricultural area which requires a conditional use uh, based on criteria that the Land Development Code specifically articulates and which your staff has specifically provided findings of fact in indicating to you that the applicant has met. So that is the issue and the conditions that we are here before you. Are there additional details and questions that are unknown? Yes. Are there processes in place that the commissioners have helped to assure you that things will go well and be in that sense compatible? Yes. The entire land development code must be compatible with the future land use comp plan. The entire process must be in, in, compatible. It all works together. And that is how this situation will work because the project meets all of those conditions. If it did not meet those conditions, then your staff would have alerted you and they would have recommended not approval. And you know that because they absolutely did that a year ago when this project came and it did not meet all of the requirements the staff recommended non-approval and you followed that recommendation and denied it the applicant came back doubled the buffers and that is the difference between the project yet then and now and it is a diff it is a difference that matters because buffering is the compatibility mechanism by which we use between inconsistencies in uses. I will remind you again, if you look at the zoning though, we're talking about agricultural. The, uh, the, the Mr. Bates's client is on agricultural property. It's zoned agricultural. 
he has a house on it like Mr. Patterson wants to build a house. And that's perfectly fine, right? That's their rural residential is a permitted use just as a borrow pit is a permitted use in the agricultural land. They are not incompatible. That's their, the, the process is compatible with the proper conditions. Those conditions are articulated in the code. Those conditions have been met according to the testimony, the competent substantial evidence that's before you in the form of your own expert staff and in the information that's been presented. Again, I thank you board members. I will not be back before you um, on this particular area. Mr. Bates will talk to you afterwards. But I do just remember that your burden is to, because the applicant has met its burden, that is shown that it meets the criteria. The code says you shall approve the conditional use unless you determine as the board that the substantial and competent evidence which has been submitted to you at this hearing, not in past hearings or anything else or other information, but at this hearing, indicates to you that this is an public, this is adverse impact to the public, and I submit that it is not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. As a point of clarification, the board makes a determination as to whether the applicant has met the burden. Then the burden shifts, and in that case, if the board finds that the applicant has satisfied the required conditions, then the board would have to make a finding that granting the conditional use would be adverse to the public interest. That's the standard. Staff makes a recommendation. <clears throat> I know that you're tired of hearing from lawyers. Uh, so is my wife. Uh, I will do what I can to be succinct. At the same time, <clears throat> I think there has been what I would consider a barrage of misinformation. We're not here to talk about the public. We are talking about the compatibility with adjoining uses. So every time someone said we're talking about the good of the public, that's not what the charge is here today. Secondly, in terms of burden of proof, I would remind you all of the sage phrase, saying it don't make it so. The fact that someone says, we think it's compatible, that is not substantial competent evidence. Substantial competent evidence is, here's what we're gonna do to contain the issue of dust. Here's what we're gonna do to limit the noise. Here's what we're gonna do to keep from having an ugly scar on this ground. That's evidence saying, given all of that, we conclude that it is not inconsistent with the residential use surrounding this. You will recall while I was asking the staff questions, how many times we heard the phrase, I don't know. The phrase has been justified by saying, well, other agencies or bureaus or bodies of the Escambia County government or otherwise will have a say-so there. It is not the prerogative of this board to abdicate its individual board responsibility to evaluate this case according to the land development code requirements. And for this board to say, well, we won't worry about that, someone else will, that's abdication. That is inconsistent with what the duty of this group is today. One of the issues I might point out is that we do not know, as a practical matter, how enforceable or not someone else's rules might be if an adjoining landowner has a problem with it not being done. Mr. Connors and Ms. Dortch and others are here today possibly in the only situation or circumstance where they will have some ability to control what happens not downtown, not in Pace or Molino, but what happens right next to where they live. 
I thought about that. How many of us live in a subdivision? I live in Cordova Park. There is no active borrow pit there, and I can't imagine someone trying to put one there. But let's talk about what the specific code requirements are for this board. This is for a conditional use, and the land development code says, a use because of its special requirements or characteristics may be allowed in a particular zoning district on a specific site only after the Board of Adjustment confirms compliance with all conditions prescribed by the LDC as necessary to ensure, not to hope, not to we think it'll happen, to ensure compatibility, not with the public interest, but with surrounding existing or permitted uses. What do we have before this board today to ensure the compatibility of this project with Ms. Dorch's property, which adjoins it on the north, with Mr. Connor's property, with the Kite property, with the other people who are here, not because they live a mile away, but because they are affected by what happens on this parcel, just as you would be for two doors down from you wherever you live. And so the question is raised then, well, we only have to be considering people within a thousand feet. Well, no. A thousand feet criteria is whether that determines whether the issue has to come before you all. It doesn't say that once it's before you all, your only charge is to determine whether or not it's okay with the people within a thousand feet. The code provision in the terms defined doesn't say ensure compatibility with surrounding or existing uses within a thousand feet. It says ensure, not hope it works, but ensure that it is compatible with surrounding existing or permitted uses. Now, what are the surrounding uses? Well, we heard, and you've seen the map and the exhibits. The surrounding uses are residences. They're not stores, they're not strip malls, they're where people live, where they live 24 hours a day, where their kids play, where they run their cattle, wherever they do whatever is done at a residence. And now, somebody wants to come in and put a 40 acre, 40 to 60 foot deep hole in the ground. And Mr. Connors has a well right there. Okay, well, maybe he shouldn't have a well. I don't know what the license requirements are, and I don't suggest that it matters in this con, it was never asked him as Dorch. But the fact is that the Land Development Code has a 37-page list of definitions, 37 pages. And in that 37 pages, when I asked for a definition of a well, staff couldn't produce one. Well, what they did do is they, through their counsel, wrote to Mr. Jones and Mr. Day on January 31st of this year saying, does the term wells within section 4-5.9 B3 refer to public potable water supply wells? If you will look at 4-5.9, a caption at the top saying wellhead protection, you will see that is not the section of this statute which is at issue here. The statute at issue here is 4-5.9C, Restrictions on Development. Now it says in unequivocal terms, unequivocal terms, no borrow pit within 500 feet of any well north of County Road 196. That's not, you have the right to overlook that. That's not something that says, well, it's got to be potable because potable is not a qualifier for this particular provision. There is un, 
disputed, unequivocal proof before this board today that there are at least two wells within 500 feet of this project, and that is an absolute prohibition. It isn't because you all have the right to determine whether or not it's consistent with adjoining uses, but that's aside. This is an absolute statutory provision and a prohibition, and with all due respect to Mr. Jones, an interpretation otherwise is inconsistent with the clear language of the Land Development Code itself, which prescribes how something like this is to be determined and defined. Even if it wasn't, why is that language there? Why is all of this language about wells included in these various provisions? It's because a borrow pit is inconsistent with the use of a well. So even if you didn't have to get to the regulatory part, which absolutely prohibits it, in which I suggest would make any decision in favor of this particular project absolutely reversible in court, even if we didn't have that absolute provision, you are supposed to ensure that it is consistent with the adjoining property owners. And the reason the prohibition next to Wells is there because it's not consistent. And you can't ensure that it is. Furthermore, we have no evidence of what it is that's going to control dust. I haven't heard the answer to that yet, not from the staff, not from their expert, not from the application before you all. They have no running water on site, so there's not going to be somebody standing out there with a hose dusting down everything before the truck drives away. Uh, we don't know. Staff said, we don't know. So what are we doing? We understand from this record and the application that was submitted, they were supposed to tell us what they're going to do about reclamation. Well, don't worry about it. We'll get to that later on. We do not know, even if Mr. Patterson will be alive 10 or 12 years from now, whether this will become an abandoned site. We have no idea what happens once this huge scar in this earth is imposed. So, 10 or 12 years from now, do we have a wedge wood, a rolling hills? I don't know. But what I do know is that the very best that has been said is, well, we don't want to do that, and we promise we won't. In the business I'm in, that is illusory at best. That is not competent, substantial evidence. It is not satisfactory. It is not in compliance with their obligation to come to you all with clear, substantial, competent proof. What you have gotten are conclusions. And however tempted you may be to say, well, you know, these guys just need to get along. Maybe we just need to approve this. I know that this guy really has good intentions. I believe him. That is not what you are charged with doing. You are charged with ensuring that this is not incompatible with the approved uses. The approved adjacent uses are residential. I am hoping, and I, and I will mention this in particular because of last time, those are the findings last time by the same staff with no material change in circumstances found last time these issues could not be eliminated. They leave those out this time. I suggest that that is a very clear prior inconsistent statement which is recognized in any court of law as an evidentiary issue to be considered. So not only is there no, compa no compelling, no substantial proof to support what they've done, no facts of what they're doing that's going to keep these from being a problem, in addition it's inconsistent with their own findings previously. They have a conclusory finding that just says it's going to be okay. That is not competent, substantial proof, not in any court. And this is a quasi-judicial body. I know you're tired of hearing from me. I've had a lot to say, but it's important. And I'm, I, I, my hat's off to you all for doing the job you do. Uh, I suspect that whatever they're paying you is not enough. I apologize for taking your morning and partly into the afternoon. I'm pleading with you to please recognize this for what it is. It is your responsibility 
as a board to find that there is no competent substantial proof to support this use as being consistent with the approved adjoining uses. And furthermore, I would add that the provisions with respect to the well north of that road, the number of which I now forget, that is not equivocal. That is clear as a bell. And I urge you to do what I think was the proper thing last time, and which I hope is indicative of the credibility of this board, and that is reject this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any, Mr. Chairman, statement? Mr. Chairman, oh yes, um, we approved some exhibits um, from Mr. Bates, and I was wondering if if we could have a moment to review those exhibits. I'm sorry to do what the the exhibits that we approved mm -hmm. from Mr. Bates. Uh -huh. I was wondering if we could have a copy of those to look at for a moment. Oh, yeah. county. County, huh? He's got one. We've, we've got them digital as well. I mean, if you need to make, we can go make extra copies. I have two printed copies in addition to what we've told us today. Yeah. Did you want to see them now? Mr. Chairman, while we're doing that, I'd just like to say that uh, I found Mr. Patterson to be a compelling witness, and I certainly uh, accept his uh, uh, explanation of his plans uh, for this project and the uh, construction of a home. I wish we'd heard Mr. Patterson a little earlier uh, but uh, I was glad to uh, uh, get his uh, undertaking before us, and at any rate, I did find him a uh, credible witness uh, as it relates to that particular matter. Mr. Chairman, if I could, um, I, just, I would apologize for that. Mr. Patterson actually wanted to speak earlier and his lawyer uh, did the arrangement based on what we thought was the right uh, time to, to hear. But thank you for that. Um, the other thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Uh, Bates indicated that you don't, you know, there's no guarantees. Um, the board certainly, and is certainly within your power, you've done it before. You can conditional the approval on whatever you, you know, Absolutely. conditions you want. And I know yes. Mr. Jones can talk to you about that, yes. but if the idea and the concern is that it's going to be a Wedgwood or a Rolling Hills, simply make a condition that it can't be, and that the, the approval will be that, that, and then you will have your guarantees, so you won't have to rely on it. So I know Mr. Jones can talk to that. I just want to make sure. Yes, yes, um, yes, and, and you do have the authority to put um, added conditions on it. For example, if there's a need, yes, there will be fencing requirements. There will be, the, the be a fencing. If you want to extend the buffer requirements, if you want to have higher fencing to, to, to around, the, around the property, um, you can. If, so, so anything that you think that is conducive without, without hampering the, um, the, the plan or the business, you definitely have to provide more adequate protections that you may deem is necessary. That is something that you can do. That and, and y'all boy have done that previously. I do want to say that. Mr. Well, Bates? I'm sorry, I didn't realize if Mr. Jones was going to make a closing or that there was going to be a rebuttal after my conversation earlier. Uh, it doesn't impair or impugn the integrity of Mr. Patterson a little bit. <laughs> to say that he doesn't know what's going to be around 10 to 12 years ago from now when it comes time to close this well or close this uh, this pit. And we don't know what his financial circumstances will be, nor does he, nor do we know if he'll even be around. The issue is not whether or not we trust him or not. I have my own views. We all do. The issue is 
who can tell us what they're going to be prepared to do financially or otherwise with respect to something that's 10, 12, or more years from now? And that's, I'm sure that when these other pits were created, there were lots of assurances and good intentions. It's not the assurances and good intentions that get us in trouble. It's the inability to comply with them down the road. In any event, I, I said more than I should have, but I didn't realize I had a second advocate for the application. I, I was not being an advocate. I was stating something that Mr. Will Dunaway alluded to me. And as a director, I just wanted to basically add to the board that you can not advocating for anything, just saying yes, that can be done based upon the powers and authority of the board. I just want to clarify that for the record as well. Thank you. Does the applicant have any closing remarks at all? That was it. That was it. Thank the board. Thank you, sir. <coughs> The chair will now entertain a motion regarding this item. In your motion, please state whether or not you adopt the staff's findings of fact. If for any reason you do not accept staff's finding of fact, please go through all the criteria and address each one specifically as to why you do not occur. The chair is open for a motion. Okay, I'm going to try and make a motion. Um, I move that that we do not approve this conditional use based on criterion A, D, <clears throat> H and some aspects of I and they all kind of go with the same concept that I've been trying to get out of various uh, people in various ways as to what impact digging a 44 acre hole and making it into a pond is going to have on the adjacent wetlands, on the adjacent wells, um, on the adjacent aquifers, um, and, and with that information, I can't determine whether or not this proposed use will be or won't be a nuisance. And until I can um, understand um, that, uh, you know, I just can't make a, uh, a good faith determination that this, this won't affect. I, and I can't conceivably think how it would not affect um, those items. Mr. Chairman, I'll second the motion for discussion. Can you recap the, the, the motion? What the, what, what's the criteria? Mm -hmm. the um, a as an apple. Maybe G. if we could see them on the. <clears throat> A D H and I Okay, we have a motion, we have a second that we do not accept staff's findings of fact, and they're based on uh, criterion A, D, and H, and I. 
discussion. Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> I know there's been some discussion uh, between legal counsel as to whether or not uh, the prior findings of fact in the other, the earlier decision are relevant. I think they are relevant and although we are trying or hearing this case, I, the reason that I have uh, wanted us to also think about as a part of our discussions the earlier findings of fact of the staff is this is the reason is that from the testimony we heard this morning the collective testimony from both engineers uh, if I uh, if my memory serves me correctly and I believe I asked this question, and I know at least once, uh, what is the difference between the submittal a year ago and the submittal today, or the one we're considering today? And the answer was the buffer increased, and there was a small reduction in the area of the size of the pit. I just am having a hard time accepting that one or those two things uh, are so material that they change the entire uh, uh, original position of the staff. And uh, that's one of the things that trouble me. Uh, the other th thing that troubles me is compatibility. We have, we heard evidence from uh, the uh, engineer representing uh, the opposition to this project and we accepted his exhibit of the number of homes that have grown up around that area and the engineer for the applicant I ask whether or not there was any quarrel to that uh, particular finding or that particular uh, exhibit as to the number of, of families that have homes in the general border area and there wasn't. So I can't see where this, uh, this project is compatible with those with the homes that are already present and so that's another area that troubles me. And I did get testimony, and again, this is a little more tangential, in, in my opinion, in some ways, uh, because it does delve into the unknown. The first two things I've cited are known. They're evidence that's before us. The third thing, considering whether or not water wells, border water, private border well, water wells would be affected is, is an unknown and I accept that, that it is an unknown. It's a possibility. The world is full of possibilities that doesn't make them uh, occur, occurrences. So, but it, that it is out there and it's not an unreasonable concern or unreasonable thought. So you have at least those three things that that I have thought about and uh, I just don't see where 
this project is going to be compatible. And to say as much as the is, and I'll, I accept and I agree with Mr. Homer on this point, the county does is more stringent and does undertake more uh, examinations of, of uh, pits now and is much tougher on enforcement now than in the past. But even knowing that, I can't accept the proposition that unequivocally that there would be no nuisance uh, uh, conditions occurring uh, if uh, if we were to approve that, I just cannot accept that as a fact, knowing what this is. I mean, we're talking about uh, a major mining kind of operation, and it uh, involves not only dust, but it surely must involve noise and uh, other disruptions and I I'm just kind of at loss to accept a sort of a blanket guarantee that those kinds of things won't occur that's another area and that's sort of the things I'm I'm considering thank you thank you sir any other discussion yeah I um I too have the same concerns that have been previously uh, raised. I just want to clarify um, why though. Um, first of all, the site characteristic um, to me uh, does not warrant um, a business. Although the property is um, zoned agricultural, um, it's surrounded by residential and it will likely um, become more residential in the near future. And with a project like this um, lasting over many years, um, it, it occurs to me that um, the characteristic of the, of the project um, interferes more and more um, as growth moves out there. Um, I use as an example, um, I live about 10 miles northwest of um, this site and within a mile or a mile and a half of my house is a borrow pit a relatively new borrow pit um, it is on agricultural land also but it has no houses surrounding it at all and i have yet to hear anybody in, in my area um, complain um, because they aren't affected um, because it is remote um, the applicant for this project um, has not selected a remote enough site for a borrow pit to um, suggest to me that um, it that it's compatible thank you sir any other discussion the uh, motion is to not accept staff's findings of fact and uh, reject the conditional use motion made by jennifer bass second by mike godwin those in favor signify by raising your right hand those opposed you opposed no one nay he's not voting you're recusing yourself no 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 he's in favor yeah oh okay so we have uh, uh, six yeas and one recusal. Motions, uh, conditional use is rejected. Do uh, we have any business uh, to discuss? We have a meeting next month. Uh, next third month. Next next month, third Wednesday of the month, which I believe will be the. Do you have a date on that? How many cases? Two conditional uses. 
the the eighteenth. Um, you need to go ahead and adjourn, please. Without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you.